All right, everyone. Um, Mr. Chair, we are live. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will be the acting chair while we go and uh, get into the process of electing a chair for the committee. I wouldn't point out that in the terms of reference, which will be an item on the agenda today, is that there's actually no process for the election of a chair. Um, the MD administration has been chairing this for over a decade. So uh, the direction that I've received from council is that a public member should be the representative on this committee. So we'll, we'll have to make some amendments to the minute to the uh, terms of reference for this committee. However, I think we can move forward and elect a chair and then go into make the proper changes to the terms of reference. So could I have nominations for chair, please? I'll nominate Dino Sin. All right. Dino, Second. do you accept? Yeah, I do accept, yeah. Okay. All around the table, everyone's in agreement. Okay. So, Dino, um, please uh, chair the meeting. Oh, boy. Right into the fire, eh? <clears throat> so, I, I guess the first thing we have to do is uh, call the meeting to order, right? Correct. Yeah. So, uh, it's three minutes after or two minutes after four call the meeting to order yeah uh, and then next on the agenda would be the approval <clears throat> approval of the past agenda excuse me dino i want to jump in and make a motion right at the very beginning and my motion is that we move item five we either put a five minute restriction on each update or we move it to the last and it's not that I don't want to hear those updates, but we have a bunch of important decisions to make, and I'd rather make them when I'm fresh than when I'm tired. And we usually don't have decisions to make okay, during the updates. Okay. So uh, I'd just like a decision on that by the group, please. Okay. Uh, do we, can we have a vote to... Uh, Pass the motion that Kevin Hebb has made to move uh, item number five, the update from the district and directors, the verbal updates, move that to the end of the agenda and go through the, I hate to say more important stuff first, but the, the more valuable stuff uh, and important stuff before then. All in favor? <laughs> sure. Wayne's in favor. Sure. And I Robert, don't feel I don't I don't vote, so I'm fine. Yeah. yeah. Well, feel free to jump in and help me out here because this is the I first will, time I'll, I'm doing this. So that, that's my job today, you know. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate it. So is uh, it okay. a direct swap for five and seven? Is I that... think we can just uh, through the chair, we can just move number five to after information. OK. OK. Okay, uh, <clears throat> moving on, uh, we have to we have to approve the previous minutes. Rob, I see Robert. Uh, um, do we have to second that, Robert? You don't have to do seconds uh, for your committee meetings or for council meetings, actually. When you approve, are you so Kevin's already addressed it with approving the agenda. He has made the motion, which has been accepted, to move a number five update of districts to after um, item seven information. Um, I guess the question would be, are there any more amendments to the agenda for today? OK. Nobody? OK. No. So then we're going to move on to the sorry. delegation. Which, oh, let's go ahead, Jen. Sorry. Um, sorry. I did. When in this committee do we ask questions about the former minutes? I wasn't there, and I, I have a question for Chief Lister. Um, and then I believe it's someone has to make the motion, uh, whoever was there, to approve the minutes. Is it all right if I ask my question now? Um, actually, this is approve the agenda. Okay. There were no other. Oh, so sorry. The, the agenda was approved as amended. And now you're now, uh, Chair Sen, you're now into the minutes. Into the minutes, sorry, yeah. So now Could, we have to you know, approve. You yeah. know, can I, <laughs> I just realized Maybe all the, you have. I've never met Jen. Oh, oh, wow. Let's have a, <laughs> let's well, let's have a little meeting then. Let's, so I just, 
Yeah. I just wanted to say hello and welcome to the committee. I'm sorry, I just, when you spoke there, I just, I know Dino for, <laughs> for a while, <laughs> but uh, nice to have you on the committee. Thank you, Tom. And um, uh, we have met. Uh, I'm usually accompanied with my other half, Duncan Smith, from Action. Oh, I, well, yeah, I knew that. I just, oh, yeah. probably at a picnic. I think you're right. I think you're right, yes. <laughs> wow. I, okay, thanks. It's been a thanks. while. <laughs> And Thank I you. have a new role. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that, Tom. I, I just, I assume that you knew everybody. Uh, okay, so now we're going to go on to approving, approving the minutes. Sorry, I oh, jumped yeah. ahead on you last time, Dino. It, can I ask a question of um, Chief Lister? Uh, I, if, I think if this is the appropriate time, Robert, yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jay. Um, you had talked about getting more uh, bottles for the SCBA and that it was now going to be three per SCBA. Yeah, what are, cool. what are, how many bottles per SCBA do we have at the other halls and what's standard? Sorry, that I'm was, learning on the fly. Yeah, we have... Um, we bought a few a uh, few packs in between, but I think we've got roughly 19 packs uh, in our fleet. So now we have a, at least uh, three times that many. We've got a few extra, so you know I've been buying a few here and here uh, along the way. So we're pretty well stocked with air balls. And is that the same in all the other halls as well? They yeah they have every every yes. Like Ghost okay. has something. Ghost has five five packs. They've got fifteen spare. They've got fifteen bottles. So they've got ten spares that they can call on. Same with Jameson. I believe Jameson has four or five packs. Four. Yeah, they've, we have four packs. Yeah. So they've and they've got bottles. spare uh, two spare yeah. bottles plus the one that's on the pack. And then oh. uh, Extra has at least three per pack plus probably another ten spares that we, uh, you know, that we can supply to other departments. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so can we get the approval of the minutes? Thank you. Mr. Mr. Hab has said yes to that. Oh, he has? Okay. Have Sorry, I couldn't mute. see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then we move on to delegations. And that's uh, Stu Walkinshaw, and he's got the MD of Bighorn Draft Evacuation Plan. So uh, I think this is uh, you now, Stu. Take it away. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm just going to share my screen here. And uh, if everybody can bear with me, I'll take uh, between five to seven minutes just to give you a real quick overview of the plan. Um, and then we'll just open it up for questions at that point. So the uh, uh, the plan um, has been ongoing since spring of 2021, um, and we're up to draft V2 now, which you all have in front of you. Um, the field work that took place for this one was uh, was interesting. Uh, uh, Rick and I spent a lot of time uh, touring around and taking a look at all the different areas from north to south. Uh, in the MD, and uh, it was a really, really interesting time uh, to take a look at the various different accesses, um, you know, where the structures are. Um, so I think we learned a lot uh, as we were doing the field tours. Uh, the plan itself is based on an outline that has been used for a few different evacuation plans uh, in this area, as well as uh, based on the provincial guidelines um, that the Alberta government has put out. Uh, it starts, it's got three sections, yeah. overview, yeah. evacuation operations, and incident organization. And then at the back end, it's got what is called Appendix 1, which are the, the overview maps and uh, the zone maps, one or two maps for each zone. And I'll give you some examples of each of these sections as we go through it. So the overview section is kind of the administrative end of things. 
It starts with what we refer to as the purpose. You know, what is this evac plan built for? Um, and then it moves into authority. And I think one of the key points for authority that you all should be aware of is that we have stated in this evacuation plan that jurisdictional responsibility for coordination and implementation of evacuations rests with the MD of Bighorn on the deeded and the municipal owned lands, and it rests with the province of Alberta for all provincial crown lands. Um, and so we went you know, back and forth on this a fair bit and uh, at the end of the day sent off a request to Alberta Emergency Management Agency for some clarification. Uh, we never got an official uh, clarification back, but the word that I got from the field officer was yes, that makes sense that the MD is responsible for deeded and municipal owned lands that the province will look after evacuation on all of the provincial lands. Um, section 1.3 uh, goes into uh, what we call the EVAC stages. Uh, these are the provincially accepted and recommended stages. Um, stage one is called an EVAC alert. Stage two is called an EVAC order. Stage three is called an evacuation rescind. And then uh, below that, uh, 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 Chief Lister and I have made the decision that we also wanted to put in shelter in place. So uh, we've dealt with that at the bottom of section 1.3. And 1.4, assumptions and limitations. Um, it just lays out some of the, the issues that may be run into uh, in an evacuation within the MD. And in particular, uh, if persons refuse to evacuate, the final decision uh, on the removal of those persons will be determined by the MD of Bighorn, ECC director, and the RCMP commander in charge, um, is what the EVAC plan states. Uh, section number two, you know, EVAC operations. This is the tactical part of the plan. Uh, this is where the actual EVAC teams will be working from. So it, it lays out the zones and uh, uh, what I've done is I've broken the MD up into 15 separate zones with zone one starting up at the north end and zone 15 uh, being what, or uh, zone 14 uh, being the hamlet of Harvey Heights and then zone 15 being all of the forest reserve lands. Um, and then uh, we have split it up uh, uh, for each zone by number of properties and any special uh, facilities uh, that need to be dealt with within each of those zones. Uh, section 2.2, public notification and information. Um, it, uh, it, it just lists uh, the various different options that the MD has. And in discussion with Leslie Ray and Ulrika uh, and Rick Lister, um, it, we kind of came upon the conclusion eventually that the MD of Bighorn website alert system and social media systems are probably the first and most common system that will be used. And then from there, it flows through to use the mass notification system, Alberta Emergency Alert, and then radio, um, and 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 finally door to door uh, and or helicopter overflights uh, when and if necessary. You know, vulnerable populations in uh, section two point three deal with both uh, uh, people uh, or or what I'm referring to as vulnerable population facilities and. We also list out the pet and livestock boarding locations. And so these are the areas that are gonna need a little bit of, of earlier thinking in terms of evacuation because of the time and the complexity uh, that may be involved with evacuations of those facilities. Section 2.4, assembly points and reception centers. Uh, the assembly points have been built um, and put on the maps um, for uh, a one for each of the hamlets. 
And then uh, I chose um, those rural roads that are dead end roads that uh, may be cut off at some point in time. And so we've put in uh, some assembly points where uh, helicopters can land uh, and pick people up if necessary. Uh, uh, Tainer Road being a good example of that. Um, and then reception centers, a uh, very simple section, uh, just basically states that the MD of Bighorn uh, Emergency Social Services Plan um, shows where the pre-established uh, reception centers are. Uh, you know, section 2.5 uh, uh, deals with house marking uh, during an evacuation, and uh, it just lifts out uh, uh, flagging colors for confirmed vacant, unknown revisit, and or confirmed and occupied, um, so that uh, we're not going back and forth into these properties multiple times with multiple different teams. Traffic control, access control, and security is a fairly simple section. Um, it first of all states that Alberta Transportation has the sole authority for closure of all highways, of all provincial highways, and that the RCMP is the primary agency for implementation of that traffic control. Um, and then it, it talks about the possible need for what are referred to as contraflow strategies. Um, if we need to be shutting down one direction of traffic on those highways um, so that we can move people out um, on all four lanes of the Trans Canada or both lanes of the 1A or 1X or, or roads like that. Um, so it just recommends uh, con uh, uh, early consideration of contraflow strategies. And then access control and security um, it just gives an overview of uh, 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 when and if uh, access uh, will be permitted for residents to go into an evacuated zone and how that may take place. Um, and oh, uh, sorry, that's re-entry protocols. Um, and then into section number three is incident organization. It lays out the organizational framework basically states that the incident management team will be responsible for actually getting people out of the area and it will be the emergency coordination center that is responsible for care of those evacuees um, and the larger scale uh, issues. Um, and then it moves into functional roles and responsibilities and it basically talks about the, uh, the roles of, of the incident commander, operations section chief, the RCMP, uh, the MD of Bighorn Emergency Services, uh, bylaw services, and the Alberta government uh, on behalf of the incident management team. And then it speaks to uh, the roles and responsibilities of the emergency coordination center management team. Uh, ECC director, yeah. ECC operations section head, the information officer, and the emergency social services branch uh, within uh, the emergency coordination center. And then the big meat of the plan, as uh, for those of you that printed it off, is there's a whole pile of maps. So there's the 15 zones uh, listed out there uh, that you see on the screen. Each of those zones have two maps. So to start, and we did maps both with, uh, uh, with imagery background, as you can see on the right-hand side, and with no imagery background on the left-hand side. Um, and so some people like the ones on the left, some people like the ones on the, on the right. So we decided to do both. Um, and people can take the maps that they prefer. Uh, so there's an overview map that shows all 15 of the zones and then there are zone maps um, and uh, as I said both with and without imagery background uh, you're looking at zone one um, and it basically shows the primary and secondary evacuation routes with red and green arrows it shows all of the the properties uh, that have people at them 
with their rural addresses over top of them if there happens to be a rural address or a 911 address um, for that property. And uh, it shows recreation areas, campgrounds, day use areas and trailheads um, and those types of things. And then uh, uh, down in the uh, up here uh, with the orange uh, mm -hmm. octagons, uh, mm -hmm. you can see what are referred to as the assembly points. Uh, we have them both for the rural areas and for the hamlets. Uh, there's an example of Lac de Zark. Hey, Stu. There's an example of, uh, just hang on half a second. And, and there's an example of the Dead Man's Flats. Uh, that's all I've got. Uh, so we'll open it up for questions. Yes, yeah, Stu, I was just wondering if you could scroll to a map and just show the everyone on the screen uh, what you were talking about with the maps, with the arrows and whatnot. Just pick oh. a sample map. It can wasn't presenting see, properly. No. Can you guys not see the maps right now? No, we see the the first page, the MD uh, Bighorn Number Eight evacuation plan. Uh, oh, and your you table of contents. You didn't see all the pages that I flipped through in this presentation. Correct. I did, but I used my own copy. <laughs> um, hang on half a second, and I'll stop sharing, and then I'll reshare and try again. It seems like an IT issue here. Um, <laughs> I know what that stands <laughs> with. <for me. laughs> I just I just went through this big fancy presentation and and you didn't see any of it. <laughs> just a minute, we'll try again. When it comes to uh, computers, the IT in my case stands. I is the first letter of the word, and T is the last letter of the word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Called an ID ten T. How now? Can you see that map? There you go. Yes. So that happens to be Lactis Arc. Um, and so that's a map with satellite imagery on it. Um, you can see primary evac routes, secondary evac routes. You can see assembly points in orange here. Uh, all of the properties in the light colored squares and each of them, it's a little hard to see on this one. Uh, let me go up to one of these. Can you see that that map now that I just went to without the imagery? Yes. OK, and it's a little hard to see without blowing it up, but the 911 addresses are laid over top of each of the squares. <laughs> <laughs> IT. So that's all I've got, guys. I just I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time talking about it. I just thought I'd open it up for you guys to ask any questions that you wish. Stu, it's very good. It's it's Wayne Dick here. Um, I, I really liked it. Um, some really good stuff there. Um, I had a couple couple of questions. They're very very minor. Um, and I guess it had to do with uh, with Jameson because that's what I'm most familiar with, of course. But uh, if you can go to 1.1. 1. 1. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And don't see so, it on here. Oh, sorry, you're on the paper one. Uh, sorry, 1.1. 1. 1, you mean uh, in the plan purpose? Yes. Yeah, that's right. Okay. okay. Yeah. Sorry, don't see it here, but okay, I'll bring up my copy. Yeah, I haven't actually got all of the sections on oh. this. Okay. on this uh, presentation um oh sorry i don't know um I, it, it's I'll, not really a big up. okay for me 1.1 1 .1 up it's it's really minor and i think it's covered by Samson 1.4 i'm just a lot of these things i deal with things that i've experienced and um over the many years out here let me just switch back do i'll get you to stop sharing for a second okay there. Do you want me to actually bring the plan up? Is that what you're asking, Wayne? I'm, I'm um, doing I think, uh, yeah, I think uh, Leslie's going to bring it up and she gets to section 1.1 1 .1 and, and uh, okay. I'll jump in. It just, uh, I think it's coming up here. So 1.1. 1 .1 uh, it's coming. 
purpose. Yeah. So the bulleted items while on. Oh, there you go. Okay, so there's four bulleted items, and it's kind of the purpose of the plan. You talk about wildland flooding, hazardous materials, and severe weather. Now, um, I wondered about a police event, and maybe police event was not large enough, and it could be covered by 1.4 called assumptions. But we did, in fact, have a very large police event many years ago up here where uh, some two, two individuals wanted for uh, murder in Saskatchewan were actually um, – actually ended up at our counselor's place and took to the bush, right? So we had to evacuate many, many people and, and the fire department did help uh, the RCMP TAC group that we used, we gave them our fire hall to stage at and stuff like that. But there was quite a bit of activity where we had to move people out. Like maybe that's not a large event. And if you go to 1.4, maybe that's covered there. Or, or the, uh, so I'm gonna sound like a lawyer now, Wayne, but mm -hmm. um, uh, in the paragraph right above those bullet points, it says evacuation may be initiated yep. by, but not limited to, any of the following hazards. Okay. So I kind of picked on the main ones that sure. came out of the hazard and risk vulnerability assessment. Mm -hmm. um, but if I would suggest that if if you guys think that it's important enough to put a a police event in there. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it to the group. But I mean, in this case here, I was kind of a, uh, I was kind of taken because I, I knew the area quite well. They actually uh, set me in a police cruiser, and I had to show them some uh, escape routes out of Jameson that were like river crossings and whatnot. And, and they never brought me back. I was basically part of the team for the rest of the night, well into the next morning, and uh, went to their staging area and talked to their er emergency response team while they went looking for these individuals that uh, had made their escape. But, um, I mean, will it happen again? Maybe not. Um, but it was a big enough event, and I really didn't know our role. I just did what the RCMP told me. And like I said, they put me in a cruiser, and we're parked in the middle of a field. And those cruisers, they reflect in the night. And, you know, I said, why aren't you taking me back to the fire hall? And he goes, no, this is our – we can't leave our position. And I remember walking away from this, this police car, and it lights up in the dark. And these guys had, had escaped in the bush with rifles, long rifles. So, anyway, it was just kind of strange. But, I mean, it was a long time ago. But uh, I wasn't sure if that kind of falls within this, uh, within uh, an evacuation plan, even if it just gets, you know, minor mention. But I'll leave it to the group. I, I'm quite fine with it out. And I think if, if Leslie scrolls on a 1.4, I thought it did say under assumptions that police events are separate or something. Uh, did I see something in there? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, no. Um, it just talks about tactical evacuations. Okay. That may need to occur. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, without a, a state of local emergency. Okay, um, not sure what the group thinks. Um, I've just tried to read through here. And I, you covered all the main things, that's for sure. I just wanted to say if there's anything a little less thought about that might might fit within the plan. Um, I, like I said, I'll probably never happen again, but uh, it was pretty exciting up here for that day and the fire department was used. And it might be, I mean, my personal feeling, Wayne, is that mm -hmm. if it's one of those things that may never happen again, yeah. it may be better not to actually write it into the plan. Um, All right. It might be better just to rely on that comment that says, <clears throat> uh, may include but not limited to the following yeah. events. Okay. You know, uh, so whatever you guys think, it, it certainly could go in there. I'm fine leaving it out. I just thought I'd kind of mention that, see if that had any any legs to it. Uh, I, I'm okay either way. You have a comment, Rob? Um, I would agree with Stu. Um, because it's such a rare occurrence, I thought I would just say that you just use the wording authority there. It doesn't it doesn't disclose it. Doesn't uh, say it won't happen. But as for, those are sort of the main points. And obviously, if the RCMP came in and something like that was to happen, um, there would be procedures in place for that to occur. Good. I've got a, I've got a few questions for you, Stu. <laughs> Probably sure, between, you, between you and Rick. Um, uh, just one question on where, where you've delineated uh, each of the zones with a number of properties. Um, those, I gather, are occupied properties. Those aren't. Uh, or potentially occupied properties that that's, doesn't include deeded vacant land? Correct. They are, okay. uh, uh, you're right. The, and, and when you say potentially occupied, yeah, they're 
it includes all of the cabins and the weekend properties as well. Right. The, okay. As long as they have a building on them. And if they have a set of permanently located RVs, we've also included them. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, and then I get down into a couple of items um, that we go under 2.3.1 uh, facilities of note. Um, a couple of, or uh, one, two, three, four that I feel are significant that are left off of the map um, from the Rocky Mountain Army Cadet Camp, uh, their learning center, uh, Kingsfold, and uh, paintball. Those are areas, those are properties that could potentially be significant in an event that would be, have, have the possibility of being um, high occupancy. And with, with both Kingsfold, more Kingsfold and the Learning Center, the potential of, uh, you know, disabled people and, and prob problematic people to remove from the area. And the Army Cadet Camp can have anywhere from one to 350 people, depending on the time of the year. Yeah, um, and I, I actually um, avoided the Army Cadet Camp simply because they're Army, and I was under the assumption that they'd be pretty organized in getting out of there. But well, I, I think it's probably a good idea. Um, and so, yeah, it might be worthwhile submit those, those names to Rick, and then we'll include them. Okay, yeah, the, the Army does, you know, I mean, when they're manned up in the summer, they do have the capability. Now, that being said, having worked there, I know that there are days when, um, yeah, you know, they have um, they have the ability to move all the cadets, but they might not have the buses on site at any one time. And I think the key thing here is that it should be identified in the plan so that they don't get missed in the information stage even if it's there so the ECC or the IC um, is aware of it. I mean, we're all aware of it up here, but bringing them into the loop and go, okay, you're ordered to evacuate, take care of yourselves, might be all that's required. But, you know, if it's not in our um, uh, inventory, they, they could get missed. And that would be, I think that would be a, a mistake on our part. Okay, so. Uh, the uh, other I ones. The learning uh, just, center. Just be, yeah, the learning center. Uh, what is the learning center? Okay, it's well, that's their. I don't know what they're called. I think that's that's what I call them. I'm not quite sure what their title is, <laughs> what they call themselves today, but that's uh, that's a place. Um, trying to think, it has rooms for uh, probably forty to fifty clients. So they do over they overnight people. They do seminars. They do weddings. They could have they have live-in staff, so they have a year-round population in there of staff and um, probably half a dozen. Um, and when they do have an event going on, they could have anywhere if it's a wedding and during the day, and they could have 50 people housed overnight over a weekend, and they could have you know a hundred plus on the grounds for a for a large scale wedding or event. So um, and it, there's only one way in one way in and one way out of there. And that's the place that just got got sold over to the, the Hilton or the Sheraton or something like that. Um, uh, yeah, it <laughs> could well be. It's been through it's been through a lot of hands and it's been through a lot of structure changes and, and idea changes, but um, they do have and we have had fires in there. We've had uh, two uh, structure fires in there that we've dealt with over the years and, and a couple of significant medical calls. And in a wildland situation, like I say, there is only one road in and one road out of that particular area. So, you know, they would have to be in the inventory and on the radar of the of the uh, IC or the ECC early on in any kind of scenario to uh, to start moving people out of there because it will It'll, it'll take some time to get that place emptied out. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, I think I know the place you're talking about, but it might be worthwhile. Just give a good description um, to Rick as to which one you're talking about or a legal description or something like that. Um, um, yeah, Rick, Rick knows exactly the place I'm talking about. 
Okay. Still, still, you'll remember that's where we went through it without stopping, and they chased after us and uh, <laughs> yeah, apologize. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that yeah. One. that's the one I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah. See, and now Kingsfold is another one that has in-house um, staff, um, and they can have, if they're having a, a retreat weekend, and even during the week, they they have the capacity to house um, around 40 or 50 people. Guests and um, staff would be extra on top of that. Um, and again, that's in up by Hugh Pepper's place. Yep. So it's it's available. It's not that far off Highway 40, but it would take time to mobilize all the people there because they they do have some out cabins they put people in. So I feel it it warrants um, identification in the plan. Okay. And we all know about the uh, quality of the uh, uh, person populating the paintball. Um, we're never sure how many permanent residents they have in there, how many people they have living in trailers and on a weekend, um, he could have the fields full. He could have up to a hundred people on site there as well. So, I think I think you know that's another one that needs needs identification. Okay, yeah, I got the four. Okay, yeah. Um, and one other point on the map, um, I'd like to see it changed. Um, hopefully that's not too, pro too problematic. Where did you come up with Salisbury Road? Well, it's, it's interesting that you, you asked that question. Um, so uh, there is a, a, a naming uh, system um, for the MD roads. And so Salisbury Road, Highway 579, it is the name that's on the map. And so I know a bunch of people refer to it as the Harold Creek Road. Um, but but Rick, maybe you want to talk to this. Um, we kind of went around and around and said, well, which ones should we use? Okay, let's put, it, we, let's put it this way. I've never heard of it. And I had talked to Eric Butters on the phone. And I said, we got a call on Salisbury Road. Let's go. And he went, where the hell are we going? He's lived here his entire life, as I have mostly, and nobody knows that road by Salisbury Road. Yeah. They will, I, the naming process aside, I don't know where that came from or who decided that, but we can't, we have to look at that because that's just not, I mean, that's like picking a name for Highway 40 and slapping, you know, call it McDougal Road. Everybody go, where the hell are you talking about? Right. Salisbury Road is not a common name. And if it shows up on some map, it needs to be I think it needs to be looked at because I think there's even a sign up there that calls it the Harrow Creek Road right at the corner of Highway 40. And that's what's on all the maps. You look at Google Maps and you look at the maps the province puts out. It's called Harold Creek Road or Highway 579. So, so, I'm, so I'm, I'm OK. I think you I think we should change it to Harold Creek. Uh, we do have MD maps. It does say Salisbury Road, um, and we ran into we did run into the same kind of issue at down in uh, uh, the Highway 68 area because uh, it's sometimes it's called Civil Flats, sometimes it's called West Jumping Pound. Uh, I think Stu had some one of the residents say, "Well, we don't know it as West Jumping Pound. We don't know it as Civil Flats. We call it Scott Lake." <laughs> so you have a pick. Right, so for this, I think we decided it should be West Jumping Pound. That's what uh, the MD know, like the staff know it as, as West Jumping Pound. So that's how we're 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 labeling that district. So anyhow, I do I agree with you, Tom. That one slipped through. It should be Harold Creek Road. Yeah, it'll you know, it'll it'll. Uh, I think if something was to happen, it'll alleviate. And we've been we've been on that road for calls, fatalities, rollovers, all kinds of stuff. And, you know. I just, I just think unless they're going to do some major thing and put a huge sign up there and do a, a big media blitz and call it Salisbury Road, you know, I think, yeah, we just need to go back to that so that it's it's in there and the ECC is transmitting information for the IC, you know, that information flow going back and forth is using common nomenclature. Yeah, I agree. If if we're if if we're using two different names. Um, then it's going to create problems. So, yeah. 
All right, uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. I have a couple of questions. Um, this is sorry, Kevin. I'm just Kevin, sorry, I'm going to interrupt. Uh, yeah. Mr. Chair, through the chair, um, you have Councillor Smith's hands up and also Rob Ellis's. Um, do you know, I'll just say if you click on the uh, two people, there should be a little icon with two people and that's an attendance list. Yeah. Can you see their hands up beside their names? I can, yeah. Yellow box, so that that's for you to uh, just paying uh, okay. attention to that, okay? Oh, sorry, I thought that was for Stu, but sorry. Uh, uh, Robert, go ahead. You're on. You're on mute, Robert. Through the chair, I was just following up on what uh, what Tom said with uh, Kingsfold Learning Center, the British Army camp. You now they've demobbed from that property. Um, is there any association with the Army Cadet League camp with the old British camp? So com they're completely separate. Yeah. Okay. They're separate. All right. That's the only question I had. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Jen, go ahead. Uh, my question is in the naming or renaming of the road. Is, uh, and I guess I'll be asking Mr. Ellis this, is there something that we should do as council to to do for these maps to expedite this process going further? Or is there a historical reason for an area to have two, three, four names? It's really historic. And the locals will have a name for it and they'll look at us and we come in and say, where's Salisbury Road? And they'll say, what are you talking about? But if you use the uh, the regular road number in the case for Salisbury, which was that 579, people will know which one that is. Um, I would think using the local, but we've also got information on our own maps too. I think it's just making sure it's consistent with what's local there. If we have to change a name, uh, we can certainly come back to council. There is a road naming policy uh, that we do have. Okay, we might want to look into that and and then make sure that there's not a significant reason that there's, it's called Salisbury. Um, I only know it as Harold Creek as well, and I'm <laughs> relatively new. So I'm in favor, but I just don't know our policy. And further to that, guys, um, and to my comment earlier, I just I just went over and pulled the the MD map, um, uh, uh, the MD Bighorn uh, uh, area roads uh, that was provided, and it does not show as Salisbury Road. Um, uh, Highway 579 has no road name to it at all on the MD map. So, um, uh, so I was incorrect in that statement. I, I, think, I think Salisbury Road is on a sign at the east end of that road. Now, if I could say something about roads like the MD maps, uh, it's really tough for emergency services because we don't show all roads and that makes it tough. Like we have local knowledge, but, you know, when we, it's really important, you know, if we hand our map over to the RCMP that it makes sense to them and when they're driving by, a, a perfectly good road and it's not shown on the map, it does lead to confusion. Same with uh, EMS, but this is a, a whole nother topic. I think that we, uh, we've we talked about before in this committee before that we need an emergency layer that shows all the passable roads. And that's gonna come up in, uh, that's gonna be very important in, in another topic again, in next generation 911, they're gonna, that's gonna be half, to, that's gonna be mandatory, so. Like I said, it's going to be a um, something we have to talk about and and do something about. Okay. Uh, Kevin, you had a question. Mm, yes, I have a request for Stu, and I'm asking that somewhere near the very beginning of this document we put in a list of the abbreviations that I used and what page they're first found on. Uh, because if anybody's reading this who 
isn't familiar with all of the abbreviations, it can be quite confusing. And you come to one and then you wonder, have I seen that before? Or is this the first time? And I do notice most times the first time they're used, the full name is there and then the abbreviation in brackets, which is very helpful. But I think it could be all put in a list, say on page three, I, 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 before the definitions, each definition and the page number where it first occurs. And then if somebody's trying to read it, and doesn't know what the abbreviation is, they know, okay, flip back to that page, and I at least know what the abbreviation is standing for. And you can flip to the first occurrence, which often gives more information on what the name means. That's, I agree, Kevin. I just, to add to that, um, is this gonna be, is this gonna be open to the public, this document? Do Robert anybody? I would, I would, I would say it's for use by emergency the emergency services group like RCMP, police, or sorry, police, uh, and uh, and you know other people in the uh, that might be doing the evacuation. Right, that they're going to be given this map. Whereas uh, you know it'll be available for the public, of course, but okay. uh, it's not really intended for the public. But I mean, it's it's not going to be hidden from them. But it's mainly for the people doing the evacuations. Right. Okay. If I could speak to that, um, I would strongly recommend that you do not release it to the public. Um, we have a complete listing of vulnerable populations in this plan, and we have maps of where all of the residences are in this plan. And I wouldn't be releasing this to anybody except your internal responders. It, okay. Sorry, this is Wayne. Just a quick comment on that. I 100% agree with that. I was going to mention that too, but is there a possibility to have another version of the map that shows the evacuation routes that can be made available to the public that doesn't have the home, obviously the home numbers and, and uh, the vulnerable populations and so on? Could it be a stripped down version that's on the website perhaps? Yeah, I think that's quite simple, and it might be something that is actually simpler done um, by Ulrika, um, who is a much smarter mapping person than I am. <laughs> so even if, they, even if you write a simple little plan to kind of explain to the residents um, that there is an evacuation plan in great detail, um, but explain to them that we've simplified it, uh, created you know a couple of paragraphs of what it's all about and show those green arrows and red arrows and showing the primary evacuation routes and the evacuation centers. I know it's covered on other documents, but something like that posts on the website, as long as it's not in contradiction to some of the other documents we have, I think that'd be a good idea. Yeah, I can provide Rick with a, uh, a copy of something the town of Banff has done um, for their evacuation planning purposes for their residents. It's a little pamphlet. Yep. I, I would also I would also recommend that uh, in that pamphlet you would have uh, something explaining the house markings because there's if there is an evacuation and something does happen and I'm going back to the tw uh, flood of 2013 uh, we marked some houses and people didn't know what those markings meant so I feel that if we had an explanation in a pamphlet, like Stu's talking about from the town of Banff, that explained what the green status was, what a yellow status was, and what a red status was, uh, of the marking of a home, so people understand it, I think that might be beneficial to some people who don't really get the coloring system. Stu, your thoughts on that? Uh, my only thoughts on that would be that... Um if you have declared an evac order, then people shouldn't be there and they shouldn't be seeing those flags anyways. Um, so it doesn't really matter if they know what green, yellow and red is. They're not supposed to be there, I guess, is the <laughs> is the big point, you know, and I know we will we'll be there, but yeah, I, I don't know that you need to to explain to them what those colors mean because they're defying um, 
an evacuation order under a state of local emergency. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any comment on my original question, Stu? About the abbreviations in a list? Uh, sure. I'm I, actually, while you were talking, I was looking through and I, I kind of made an effort to take out any acronyms. So um, could you send Rick some, a list of the abbreviations that you're speaking to? And uh, then sure. I'll, I'll make a note of that right now. So I yeah, like I, 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 I purposely went through and I tried to take out all of the acronyms and put them into full words. Um, so yeah. Uh, that would be great if you could do that. Yeah, because even ones like ECC or DEM or ESS or IMP, uh, ones I noticed, but the first time they are used, I think it's always given what they represent. But I will definitely go through and make a list and sure. send it to Rick. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. like I said, the, the document's intended for people that are should be well versed in ICS and the terminology. So I, I mean, I, I think it's fine to have a table with those uh, explanations, but really the people with using a document should should know what they mean. Oh, I agree with you 100%. I, I'm looking at it for my benefit. And last time I read all of these names was just over a year ago. And I spent quite a bit of time flipping. And I just figured it might be somebody else who ends up looking at it that uh, it would be beneficial to. Uh, my only other question was, I assume all of these maps will be available to go on the phones of the emergency responders and maybe be able to blow it up? Or is it only going to be on the iPads that uh, you have in some of the vehicles? And the answer to that is yes. Um, they will all be available in what's called geo-referenced PDF format okay. that can be used in Avenza or uh, whatever other type of uh, uh, geographical uh, uh, phone system uh, they can put it into. Yes? Okay, so every emergency responder can enlarge the section they're in and hopefully it shows everything they need to know to get to a particular house or cabin or, okay, great. I assume that was the case. I just wanted to hear it confirmed. Thank yep. you. You're on mute, Dino. All right, yeah, go ahead, Lee. All right, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't finish up. Um, Earlier on, just a couple of quick questions for, for Rick and maybe Robert um, talking about uh, facilities up on Jameson. And uh, what's the status of Trails End? Like I know during the pandemic, there's been nobody out there. I understand the British have not renewed. So is that camp coming apart or will it be possibly used for something else? It housed typically up to 200 people and residents during, you know, during the summer months when Trails End, the British Army base used it. Is that going to be pulled apart or is that going to be something that may pop up is something different. Well, I hope Wayne, uh, Rob can answer that. I'm assuming it's all going to be dismantled. Uh, you know, the, it's been in the news lately. The um, the British are, are uh, you know, pulling their bases out. So that's my assumption, but maybe Rob has better information. No, that's, that's the same information that I've, I've received. So I know it's on sale. It's on the market for for sale right now. I don't know if it's been sold, but uh, yeah. So there's nothing going on that I know of. We'll deal with it later if it does pop back up as something. I guess. Okay. Yes. Number two is in. I'm sorry, I should know better, but I know Jim Fish, one of the fellows that owned the land that was uh, basically given to uh, the girl guides up here on the Jameson, and I, I know it's in this report. Um, what really is the status of that? Like we don't see, you know, van loads of um, young ladies coming up here and camping. You know, hear some rumblings about some uh, some adults that are part of the, the group camping out there, just free camping and stuff like that. But is it a sanctioned facility that actually does have structured uh, programs? I don't know what sort of infrastructure they really have out there that we defend. Well, and whether it needs it to be went, in here. Okay, so we're looking when we went through 
the plan, Stu and I, we looked, we were trying to find air, uh, places that were occupied at all, right? So we don't want to send rescue or, or sir, uh, people mm -hmm. doing evacuation up a dead end road or they see a, you know, there's a, it's just a horse barn or something like that. We're trying to identify all the inhabitable and inhabited structures, right? So there's no inhabitable structures there. Like there's a yurt or something there, right? Mm -hmm. It's not right. permanently right. occupied. It's, it's, you know, it's, I think it's identified on our map. Like Stu might, uh, like I don't have a, I didn't print out the map, but I don't know what Stu could probably answer, answer that as far as that particular facility, but it's just randomly used. They camp on weekends programs. I have no idea, but we can't deal with that in this plan. You know, we got to deal with what we got at the moment, right? Someone changes a, what their business plan does something altogether different six months from now. Well, that, that can't, we can't let that obsolete our plan. Yeah, but it's listed as an active girl guide camp. So do I not assume that we might have to evacuate a lot of people or do well, I say, hey, been, yeah, it's going to be someday, but don't worry about it for now. I, I don't know how to handle that one. Like, should well, it show up on the list? Well, it's, there's no development permit to build anything. You know, we have no idea what they plan on doing in the future. Okay. Okay. Um, Jameson has a couple of uh, remote um, homeowners. Um, I don't know if that needs special. The, the map Z7 does cover them. One of them is kind of a, you cross a, across the uh, First Nations land right near Ghost Lake to get a series of cabins on, on the uh, height of the land into Ghost Lake. Um, that might need some special treatment. But and but most importantly, there's one more residence or two residents that are accessed on the other side of um, uh, the dam of Ghost Dam. So those people need access to uh, to a gate, electronic gate on the reservoir. Now we fire do have access to that gate codes and such. So does that need special mention at all, or or uh, do we need to identify them as as, as you know as a as a big risk? I would say they're pretty. I would say those people are pretty familiar with how to get out of there. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, they probably do it every day, but <laughs> yes. there's no other road in there. They have to cross the the gated uh, electronic gated uh, dam. As do, Again, as do first be, responders. They should be familiar about how to get out of there. Okay. All right. That was is, that it. It, uh, is that it, Wayne? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, go ahead, Robert. Yeah, let's go back to the maps and the publication of this document. Because we have made the comment that this really is an internal document for really for um, people who will be involved in emergency response to call and evacuation. Um, a concern that I have making it public, or portions of it anyway, um, with the maps that if it happens in a, a hamlet and someone gets the idea, well, I've got the evacuation plan, I don't know what I'm going to do, you don't want to get them trying to become first responders or folks on the ground making change, saying, well, we need to get out of here now. That still has to be left up to either the MD, uh, the incident commander, or what else, or the, or the provincial folks. And I'm I'm a little concerned, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, it could be used for purposes for really for some residents who, who want to, you know, they want to be proactive, and I would understand that, but maybe not the right document for them to be using. I'd like to hear some feedback, please. Well, I, 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 sorry. I'm sorry, Tom. Go, go ahead, Tom. Um, I kind of liked the idea earlier. I mean, this document, I mean, the, the body of the document and, and the purpose behind it, um, um, I think it'd be a good thing if that was available to the public through the MD website for information purposes so that they're aware of what I don't think there's anything. I, I think it'd have to be vetted to make sure that it meets FOIP and, and that there's not something in there that you want. Um, the idea of removing the roads and the actual numbers and showing where the residences are, I think would be would be critical to um, public dissemination of, of this information. Um, you know, I don't see anything in this document that is sensitive or couldn't be looked at by the public 
you know, if they if they so wish to to look at that information, other than the point about, you know, here's here's the roads and here's all these houses and here's where they all are. The main roads, the evacuation routes, the centers, the the um, you know where to go, that type of thing. I think that's I think that would go a long way to you know to making the general public um, more. Uh, um, confident, shall we say? Um, but it just needs to be looked at and, and decided on how much you put out put out there. But I, th I think I think putting it out there on the MD website would be making it available. I, I agree with that. Rick, go ahead. Yeah, good points, Tom. Uh, the, you know, I, I think there's a I I could agree with that. I think there's a danger. You know, though. When you put the document out that uh, they don't, you know, you, you've got no control of that document once you let it out there. So if you change the plan and someone's got the old plan and they're waving it in the air, well, it could cause problems, right? So I'd like the idea of keeping it minimal, but you're right. I think uh, resident, it would be helpful for them to know that, okay, in my area, they're recommending that I may go here or I may go there. Uh, that said, our plan could change too. This plan might get, uh, might have to change after, you know, like what they say, the battle plan changes after first shot is fired. So, you know, I wouldn't want that to happen to us. So, you know, that's my comment. Go ahead, Tom. You're on, you're on mute. It's okay. I forgot to put my hand down for that subject. I've got another oh, okay. couple of questions for Stu when uh, when we're done with this item. Okay. Just one further comment on on this uh, on something to release to the public. If I could just recommend everybody go to the town of Banff website, go to their emergency management section, and you can download what's referred to as the town of Banff evacuation guide, and take a look at it. That might be something that you want to think about putting out there for folks. I just put a link to it in the chat box for everyone. Thanks, Leslie. I believe that it was page seven and they just have a yeah. colorful map on which which section you you're in and how to evacuate, but it's it's pretty generic and uh, and looks great without releasing all of the details. Robert, uh, do you have anything else, sir? Does uh, anybody else have anything else for Stu? Um, yeah, I do. Just really quickly, a um, couple of or one one more item when I, we were going through the mapping and um, that this I'm not sure it's not assigned a municipal address and I don't know if, if Rick's aware of you know what we call the uh, the uh, Boy Scout cabin the log cabin on the uh, on the ghost you know when you go down through the gravel pit and past uh, six five zero four five. There's two res. That's the main access through the gravel pit. There's two full time. Or there's a full time residence in there. There's a part time resident, and then there's uh, the Boy Scouts still have a license of occupation on a piece of crown down there um, that has a cabin on it, and it's occupied intermittently. Um, hasn't been for the last pan couple of pandemic summers, but we have had uh, we have had it used by scouts and leaders so i just it's not even identified as being there on our uh, um what is it uh, sorry i think it's zone yeah zone five it's in um and it's adjacent to household number six five zero four five i don't know if you're familiar with that or not rick no no to be honest i wasn't um but we you know we did uh we use satellite uh, like orthophotos, and right. we it's, it was part of our um, 
our wildfire pre-plan, we were looking at the roofs and and going around to these buildings, not knowing what they were. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll have to make sure that we. I think that sounds like a good one to be identified. Yeah, I mean, if they're going in there to evacuate, you know, and just they're going to check on because the. Uh, I'm trying to read the numbers here. Yeah, six five zero four nine. There's no access shown to it, but the access is actually um, off the road from 65045. I don't know um, if that would be of benefit to put in there. Otherwise, you know, somebody's going to be looking at that. They're going to be assigned that area to evacuate and they're not going to know how to get there because there is, it just shows it as being in the middle of nowhere. And you say the access goes, uh, there is a trail through the woods then that goes from, from 045 to 049? That's correct. Okay. Yep. I mean, it's it's a private. It's it probably doesn't show up because it is a private road. Actually, the road that goes through that, because um, that's uh, Eric's grazing lease that it uh, goes through part of, and it doesn't turn into patent land until you get to the uh, doesn't turn into deeded land until you get to that uh, um, vertical vertical line in there. Everything between the summer village of Wipers and that uh, um, road allowance is that's all crown and eric has that um crown lease there but that's the access for um three potential occupied dwellings and it only shows one anyway right. okay just just uh um and then the other comment yeah, yeah and if i can from, just stop you for a minute tom yep. just to clarify uh, the one you were talking the boy scout cabin through the gravel pit that's is that, uh, that's zone four isn't it um um, I'm looking at the map. It says zone five, right about the summer village of Wipers. Yeah, that's the map. Okay. Okay. So, so east of the summer village of Wipers, there's a road going south towards the river. Yep. To six, that's the access five. road for zero four five. Yeah. That's the same access for zero four nine. Yep. And it's also the same access for that occasionally uh, populated cabin right it's right down on the ghost river oh okay and that and that cabin you're talking about is between four five and four nine no nope, it's to the west of four five west of four five correct okay. right where yeah you just right keep going down the river keep no other direction i'm watching oh. your little hand go down go down go down go down right about there is where that cabin is Okay. And we've been down there on burning complaints. We've had to go in there and shut them down and a couple of times. So I, I do know that they do use it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I had to. I forgot about that one when we were talking about different uh, properties previously. Um, and the other comment, we we're talking about the availability of this mapping. Um, and the question was about it being available electronically. Um, that's wonderful till you get past fire hall. So you get west of here and you get onto Richards Road, your electronic maps and your ability to access them and download them is nil. So uh, just something to keep in mind, you know, for an, an area up here, if you're assigning, you know, unless unless it's thought of, unless the ECC and the Unified Command and the ICC and your um, partner agencies are aware of it, they can download that map um, at at the fire hall here if this is going to be you know used as a as a center. Um, but once they get past here, they won't be able to download it. They'll have to have paper in hand to uh, find all these properties. Right. So 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 <laughs> it depends on what type of software the emergency responders are going to use. So I come from a wildfire background, Tom, and. Right. And Avenza is the program that everybody uses. So you're right. Uh, you need to actually get those maps downloaded onto your iPhone prior to leaving cell phone coverage. Once you've right. left cell phone, but the program works just fine out of cell phone coverage as long Once as you've you got the map already loaded up. Yeah. So, I yeah. mean, we work all the time in right. absolutely no cell phone ground. It works yeah. just fine. So. Yeah, trust. You know, I mean, we're we're relying our our main agency for evacuation purposes is the RCMP, 
and not to disparage the young constables, but they live by their cell phones and they think that they work everywhere in the world. And, you know, you know, they may have to be, you know, I don't know if we need to, to address it somewhere in the document or just make it a part of the training process, but it, it's, you're aware of it because of your, your career and your background, you know, your average, uh, your average constable that just came here two weeks ago from Halifax hasn't got a clue. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only solution to it, um, from an emergency response perspective is going to be when the RCMP, uh, evacuation, oh, it doesn't matter if it's RCMP or, or the, or Cochrane search and rescue, you know, whoever. Uh, when they show up at the ghost fire hall, um, you know, you're going to have to tell them if you want these maps electronically, you need to download Avenza onto your iPhone right now. And then you email them the map for the zone that they're going to, and they pop it into their Avenza and away they go. Okay. Yeah. All right. I that, that's good to know you're talking to a techno idiot here. So, <laughs> Well, that might be something where we do a little bit of training for everybody as to how they can actually get this going. And I don't mean all the RCMP because they're going to shift in and out and, right. and and they transfer back and forth. But uh, maybe what we do is we get all of you guys trained up as to how to make it easier for them uh, prior to them leaving the fire hall. You know? Yeah. Sure. Does anybody else have anything for Stu or with regards to the documents? I uh, have one last question. question. Oh. And cool. uh, it's connecting with the FIO last summer in Dead Man's Flats, but it relates to this. And when I read through the document on the fire, it said that Alberta wildfire assumed command once they got there and saw it was a forest fire, not a, okay, not a structure. And then they took command and the ECC director in consultation with the IC, okay, okay, okay gets to make a decision on evacuation alert or evacuation order. And then later on in the day, it's mentioned in the document uh, that the MD tried to contact uh, Alberta Wildfire to get updated information that evening. And the, the Wildfire Information Officer was not available or couldn't contact him for some reason. And the next morning, the, they got a hold of the industry liaison and then got up to date reports for the next three days or whatever it was. And I'm just wondering exactly how that's supposed to work. Meaning, should that information officer have been available the whole time for well, updating the MD so the MD could put it on their emergency system? Uh, yeah, I'm just wondering where the gap was because everybody seemed to agree that there was that the ball was dropped somewhere for keeping locals informed on how serious the fire was. Any comment on that, Stu, or can you clarify? Yeah, no, I don't think it's my place to comment on that, uh, uh, Mr. Hebb. Um, yeah. That's probably uh, uh, Chief Rick Lister or or CAO. Uh, Rob, that should speak to that. Uh, Rob, I see you have your hand up. Did you want to speak to that? Yeah, through the chair, actually, uh, Mr. Hebb, you're actually jumping ahead into the agenda. Um, the evacuation plan is, is not related to that fire that occurred in Dead Man's Flats, um, but I'm happy to talk to you about that when we get to that particular item. I just thought maybe Stu, with his expertise, and I'm not asking Stu to criticize somebody i don't mean that I, i'm just saying should that information officer have been available according to the way plans are laid out uh yeah because according to the plan what should have happened is my question i do not want criticism of the alberta wildfire that was not the intent 
so according to the plan, um, uh, the plan uh, dictates that you have um, four options. You, know, you have the option uh, to do nothing if there is no imminent danger uh, to uh, the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats, or you have the, uh, the option to declare an evacuation alert to put people on warning, or evac order to tell people they need to leave now. Or they can be told to shelter in place because it is unsafe to leave at, at this uh, time. So that's what the evac plan states. You know, okay. those are the options. Okay. And since Alberta wildfire was the one that assumed command, uh, that information comes from them and then is dispersed to the MD director of emergency services. Is that the way the chain of command is supposed to go? It either yeah. goes to the emergency director or it goes to the deputy and I'm the deputy. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. And we can continue. I realized it was on there later on, but I thought Stu might have something to add that uh, 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 that we may have missed otherwise was the purpose of the question. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert, I see your hand is up again. Is that uh, nothing? Okay. Does uh, anybody else have anything for Stu with regards to the documents? I'm seeing... I'm seeing nothing, so uh, I guess that's it, Stu. Uh, I, we really appreciate Oh, If I could just make one final comment then in closing. Uh, if I could ask everybody that has made recommendations for revisions or additions to the plan, if you could just send those bullet points to Rick Lister for his review and consideration, and then Rick will pass it over to me um, on which items uh, need to be addressed in the final copy of the plan. Okay. Uh, Rick, you had something to add? Well, yeah, I was just going to say that same thing. Uh, appreciate those comments of things that we missed. Um, and, I, and, you know, I think uh, it was a lot of work. We, I sure learned a lot about RMD and, and there was a lot of surprises there. I don't think I think it's a, a pretty good all round plan. I got when we got a lot of give a lot of thanks to Ulrika with her, uh, yeah. you know, her uh, mapping and all that ability. Really, uh, really appreciate it. We'd been lost without her for sure. And uh, I guess the one thing I had no idea how many uh, how many properties in the north part of our MD have locked gates. And there's going to be a, you know, I worry, I worry about that, but I don't think there's a whole lot we can do about that. If people want to lock their gates, uh, they're, you know, it's just, a, it's, a, I, I, it's, I'm uncomfortable with it, but I don't know what we can do about it. Uh, that was a big eye opener for me. <coughs> we, but, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Leslie. Uh, Robert, go ahead. Yeah, so for the committee for next steps. So when you send in all your comments to, to Rick and he passes them on to Stu, uh, the document will be revised and it will come back to this committee for the final review. And then we'd like to take it to council for approval. Okay. Uh, would that be all then, uh, Robert? Yes, Move, yes moving it is. forward. Yep. Okay, Stu, thank you very much. Greatly appreciated. It, it is a really well done document. And Rick, to you as well. I know a lot of work went into it. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, so now we're on to our next uh, item on the agenda. And I, I believe we're going to skip right to new business. Is that correct, Robert? Yes, it is. Yeah. So uh, under new business, we have uh, uh, reviewing the bylaw 16. Uh, 16 slash 11 schedule B, the terms of reference review. Uh, through the chair, when we have the, when all the committees meet for the first time, uh, they do get a terms of reference for all the participants. 
And it's always a good time to just do a little uh, little check on each one, make sure they're still relevant, if there's any changes to make. Uh, so this is an opportunity for the committee to uh, delve into it and, uh, and just see if any changes are required to the terms of reference. And I would suggest right now there probably is because we need to be sure about clarification of when the chair is elected. Okay. And everybody's had a chance to review the uh, terms of reference. Is there any, does anybody else have anything else to add? Um, the other thing that I would add to this other than the um, election of the chair would be um, under committee membership, um, the CAO shall serve as recording secretary. I would offer up the CAO or designate um, shall serve as recording secretary because I know that we uh, we have Linda Gale who is extremely talented at these recordings um, doing it and I would suggest that it read or designate. Okay. Does anybody else have anything that they'd like to add? Robert, yeah. go ahead. Sure. Um, just following up on what uh, Jen said, I'd like to put the wording in uh, that the seat, as opposed to the, just to designate, um, I might bring any number of my staff into here to talk to you at any one time. So I do think that it may bond to say that uh, the, CA, uh, the CAO shall appoint any staff required to provide services to the committee. And that covers off the Linda Gale's uh, position doing the, doing the minutes and anything else that we want to add to this. Rob, um, could you please repeat that? I I went down for a bit and I'm just back now. Okay, actually I've got the wording because I was actually dealing with it at the MEC and I have the wording exactly what you need. So if you just give me one minute, I'll just bring it up and we can talk about it. Okay, Jen, here's the wording uh, that I'd like to use. So what we'll do is this says after administrative liaisons, there's a period and it will say the CAO will assign administrative staff as required to support the committee. And that, that's consistent now with what I'm recommending for the committee membership for the, uh, for the MEC committee. I agree with that, thanks Rob. Okay. Okay. So does everyone have, else agree with that? I'm Robbie, good. Rob, is, I, is this something? Is this something that we have to uh, make a motion on or a vote on to accept? We have to accept the uh, one. We're going to do the election of the chair, and then the the motion of the CAO will assign 
the CAO staff to assist the committee. So we have to make a motion on that, correct? Yes, you do. So it would be a bit basically a two part motion. Um, yep. The first one would be about the wording, and that would be for the uh, selection of chair. And then okay. this is two seconds for what that wording is going to look like. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any way to possibly make it a three part motion? <laughs> Do you have more? <laughs> I did. I'm sorry, I... guys. Um, meetings. Um, I know right now that they are um, on on-call basis, generally twice a year. Is there yes. any way to um, meet more often so that things like um, the plan can be brought forward to council uh, earlier? And so that we can have some consistency in dates, like maybe meet quarterly or more. Yes, Rob. Through chair, you can do that. What we've been doing is with the information is coming uh -huh. forward for the committee review. That's when we call the meeting is called. Meeting is called uh, by the call of the chair. Obviously, I would be talking to Dino about this uh, when to call a meeting. We're going to be having a meeting pretty quick to get this evac plan to council. So I think the wording there is just not less than twice a year. That's just a minimum. Um, I would say we would be doing it all. Literally, we just do it when we need to. Okay. You know, I mean, that's... I, I, yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Robert. And, and while we're at it, in the committee membership, can we remove head guardians and replace it with just, say, fire chiefs? Can we? All right, so I'd would suggest that. Yeah, we can we can make that motion and then we would vote on it, correct, Robert? I think you'd make the yeah, you'd make a motion for that to make that change. But I think you'd also the recommendations to council, so that's what it is. But you might want to also make a recommendation of where fire gardens guardians appears in another policy, because that's where it also has to be changed. That was my thought was that we're going to address that later on in policies. And once that's, if it's agreed to, then that could kind of feed back into this, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because so, you're maybe jumping ahead, I guess. I don't know. Okay, so the motion would be just to remove the word guardians and replace with chiefs and firefighters or head guardians and guardians and replace with chiefs and firefighters. Rick, does that sound good to you? Well, I guess it's uh, up to the committee, but I, I, I would just, I'd be quite happy if it just said fire chiefs, or and their de um, and maybe perhaps their designates. Okay, but like Robert was saying, if we have guardians in other, in other, in other parts of bylaws or or whatever, then we want to replace that word with, with fire chiefs and or firefighters, right? Yeah. True enough. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But aren't you bringing that policy forward in a few minutes, Rick? Yeah, we're, it's up for discussion. It's an in, in a memo to Robert, so it's for discussion. Okay. And I hope they, I hope it goes through. <laughs> okay. Uh, Kevin, go ahead. You had something as well. Uh, well, Rick. Okay. One of the things I wanted to say was, okay, let's reward hit guardians, but that's already been done, and. And Rob, in his last comment, said the meetings will be called by the chair, but he mentioned in consultation with the CAO, because, of course, he usually has information that you wouldn't as, uh, as being the chair. So it has to be in consultation with the MD who knows what's going on. Yeah, and I would think that would be a great idea, considering I'm brand new at this. So any consultation or help I can get would be greatly appreciated. Okay. And we make a suggestion that meetings shall occur. This, this is on page 54. Meetings shall occur on as needed basis as the at the call of the chair. Can we say in consultation with the CIO? How's that? Yeah, yes. Okay. With CAO or designate? Or will it always be with you, Rob? 
you know what? If I'm not here and it's an acting CAO, they ought to automatically take that position over. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, through the chair, with the word designates being used, it is actually used under the committee shell. There's there's a couple of references there. Okay. Using with the fire gardens, if under uh, the committee shell, under item C, uh, review regular reports from the fire chief, the head guardians, and the director of disaster services. I think you might want to say there, reports from the fire chiefs, plural, and remove head guardians. Yeah. And I should stay out of this, guys, but um, uh, Director of Disaster Services has now changed to Director of Emergency Management under new under legislation. That's a good catch. Could you repeat that one more time, please? Stu, Stu recognized that uh, Director of Disaster Services is no, no, no longer a, um, a, like a position. It's now uh, Director of Emergency Management. So that's just updating in terminology. And through the chair, if I may just go back to the committee membership. Um, yes. Yeah. The really, it should say the committee chair. The committee, the chair of the committee, shall be elected from the public members. But it also could be um, a councillor too. We do have council. We do have councillors on some committees who are the chairs. So, do you just want to leave it with the public portion of it, or we would want to include the chairs, or maybe put the CAO in there too? <laughs> Well, last I heard, That's a you joke, were Jen. thrilled about that. <laughs> so we hey, I'm open-minded on everything, <laughs> Rob. I come with an open mind. You want to put it on there? We'll see what everybody else says. Nope, not doing that. I no, got it's my, after my. our meetings with legal. That was uh, they hammered that home with us pretty hard. Um, my vote is for just leaving it as public, but that's me. <laughs> Yep. But does. it's up to everyone else. All right. Again, we're going to have to make motions on all of this, right, Rob? You're going to make motions on it. And then what I suggest I do is to send the committee a redlined version of this document. So everyone says, yeah, that's what we voted on. And then that will be what will be sent to uh, council with recommendations from the committee. OK, yep. perfect. I like that. Kevin, you had that sounds good. Okay. Yes, my comment would be, and I like what Rob just said, we get the red line version so we see exactly what we're voting on. And if the legal opinion was that the chairperson should be from the public, then that's the way I'd like it to be. But I definitely okay, want the CAO and one council member at all meetings because they have information that the rest of us sometimes do not know about and sometimes that can impact a decision so i want all of the information on the table by having those two people at the meeting even if they cannot be chair yeah i'd agree, I'd agree to that as well does anybody else have anything to add or omit I, I have one further question. Rob, does it need to be in there that it's elected yearly or it, because we, as council, we do the organization every year? Does it just dictate that this will be as well? How does that work? It, it defaults to that. Okay. Because right, there's, there's a yearly nomination for new public members, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have anything else to add? Oh, Robert, go ahead. Um, I think all you need to do is we need to make a motion. This is what I would suggest we do. Um, you just make a motion that the CAO 
will present a red line version of all changes discussed today that will be forwarded to council for consideration. You follow that, I can get it all to you and we can write up the minutes appropriately. I know that uh, Linda Gale is capturing all this, but it's really, really clean if I send you the red line version and then I can sort it all out when I send it to council. Kevin, I'll make the motion using the wording that Rob just suggested. And I'll, I'll second that. And Rob, all members will get input before it goes to council, right? It to make to sure be. that, yeah. It has to be that way, yes. It's going to come back to us for us to review and discuss and then approve at that point to submit to council. Mm -hmm. Now, Perfect. you can wait another month for that, or I can give you the red line and you just send back to me, said, yeah, that's exactly what we said. Or you say, I've got more time for discussion. Fine, put it on to the next agenda because I'm still at the vagaries of when council holds their meetings, which is only once a month. So, right. yeah. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah, I agree to the motion. Everybody's yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate that. Most welcome. <clears throat> so now we're moving on to uh, we're going to move on to information mm -hmm. uh, 7a uh, the memorandum the obsolete emergency services policies and uh, rich you're speaking to that Well, I can, uh, under the assumption you guys have already read it. Um, I It's just something that uh, we did discuss it quite a while back in uh, this committee meetings about the need to update policies. And uh, so I've, I've identified ones that I think need um, updating and uh, and and here they are. And I'm just, these are my recommendations and, and uh, the, to Rob and and uh, I guess we can just run through them. Um, so starting starting one like it, it is it it is what it says. Uh, Bighorn Emergency Dispatch. Uh, it was a very complicated. It was more of a procedure. Uh, it was almost a, the button pushes a, a person had to make. And in the end, we don't we don't dispatch uh, anymore. We don't answer a 911 call. So this is all pre, all before the days of 911 service. So it was obvious. Uh, I mean, it's fairly obvious. It it's just needs to be rescinded. We uh, 911 has handled, you know, uh, you know, throughout the province uh, by uh, the uh, agencies, and we contract with Calgary Fire to answer our 911 calls and and uh, dispatch them appropriately. So. It's been replaced by by another uh, uh, thing there. So, and then the first response. This is uh, to Jameson Road. Against it's a. Uh, um, I think I feel it's dated. If you can see the dates, 1994. Uh, it was there when when they had a at the time there. It was a old pumper. It was uh, an old pumper from Exshaw, and it was a. You know a few guys that never with you know no fire training the idea was just you know hey there's a fire truck available i, I shouldn't speak speak for it but i believe at the time the mm -hmm. the uh they realized the fire truck was uh being replaced in extra and the old one that extra i had was 30 years old and they said here's an opportunity to put something on the up here and we have a little bit of fire protection you know and uh you know since then it's evolved quite a bit uh their their members are are keen they're eager they're they're taking training they're they're uh um they've developed all kinds of uh uh you know procedures amongst themselves and that and they um you know they're just they've just come well trained and well equipped and they basically are stand or stand alone i feel i mean everyone needs help once in a while and they're always free to call help from others so i'm i'm just uh i recommend it also be rescinded and it ties into another policy later on, which we'll get to when we get to it. Uh, reporting policy, we went through that in 2017. 
uh, basically it just said which what needs to be reported uh, to council and what what doesn't and uh, and I think it's working well doesn't require any changes. The emergency sort services organization this is the one that might uh, might uh, beg for a little bit of uh, discussion. It it kind of relates to the Jameson Road and and how our fire departments have developed, but uh, I'm just suggesting that we should probably have a different uh, org chart uh, built to recognize that not not only are they not fire guardians but they're fire chiefs, and I think Jameson is like I say previously there uh, they are standalone and and. Uh, and even if you look at this, uh, if you look at the the start of our agenda, it, of this agenda of today's meeting, it refers to the Jameson Road District Chief. Okay, so we already accept that that we have a District Chief in Jameson. So I, I think it all goes speaks for itself here. So anyhow, I'm recommending MD. Uh, the, the top is with the MD of Council, MD of Bighorn Council, of course. Um, and uh, the CA would report to them. Uh, the fire chiefs would report to the CA or the fire chief would report to the CAO. The district chiefs would report to the fire chief. And then, of course, uh, the the uh, various ranks of members would report to their respective district chiefs. So it's just uh, changes in the in the chain of command structure. Um, yeah, and, I, and then I, I talk again about, uh, you know, how I, I feel quite strongly that uh, we need to, you know, final or formalize uh, or just change all the reference to fire guardians and replace it with firefighters or whatever ranks we have there. And uh, and I just inserted, you know, the references to um, that's our fire bylaw, I believe, in section four. As we scroll down, I realize I'm not. No one can see what I'm scrolling through on my screen. If someone wants to let me share my screen, I could do that. Or we, or you can just let me route line like I'm doing. Um, the policy again, and then uh, you know I, I'd take questions on that because, like I say, you may want to discuss it. Policy E10, emergency services. Uh, Can I interrupt with, with apologies? Um, I, I'm going to have to bow out. I have a previously scheduled medical appointment that I can't miss. <laughs> um, so I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave the meeting and, and uh, disappear. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. Okay, right. Tom. Hey, Tom. Hey, Tom. Take care. Wow. Thanks, Tom. So, Rick, that document that you were uh, that you're talking about, that was in the agenda package, right? So, section yes. four, that's under powers and duties of the fire chiefs and members. Okay, so I'm following along the right one then. Yeah, I'm just. I don't know. Um, to share, do you want me to share my screen? Does everybody should... else have that document here? Oh, there we go. Can you okay? I don't. Can you see my my cursor? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to back up here. Okay. So there's the list of policies that um, that we wanted to talk about. This is the Bighorn Emergency Dispatch and my comments on it. Like again, it's a it's more of a procedure uh, than a policy. It's it's obsolete. We uh, have 911 service and dispatch. First respond, Jameson. Uh, I spoke about it. Um, the reporting policy, no need for change there. The emergency services organization. This is the one we may want to discuss. And there's, there's, like I say, I'd, I'd like to see the work chart reflect these. Uh, you know, this, uh, this route for chain of command. And uh, yeah, the old, the old one was uh, CAO. Uh, council to CAO to fire chief, um, and then and then to uh, 
I forget what I be honest with you. I forget what the old org charts read, but we are making this change here to district chiefs, including Jameson. And again, this is a memo, so uh, that's why you're not looking at the actual policies themselves, because it's simply a memo to to Rob. Uh, and then here, <clears throat> this is where we left off. Um, this is what the policy says. Uh, so we can. It, it goes the uh, council, the CAO, the fire chief, the district chiefs, no mention of fire guardians. Uh, and like I say, this this agenda we're working on right now refers to Jameson Road fire chief or district chief. So it needs to be changed to reflect what we're saying right here, in fact. And then uh, and then we have the ability and then in the districts we have captains, lieutenants, senior firefighters, whatever ranks we can come up with. And that's uh, and we also have say the similar statement in our fire bylaw up here. Fire chief um, is a, is a authorized to establish rules, regulations, policies in any committees, and they're able to appoint members. So I think that gives us the leeway to appoint the fire, the district chiefs or fire chief is able to uh, appoint different ranks within his authority. So I'm just trying to, um, again, work, you know, get rid of that term of fire guardian for the most part. Policy E10, um, uh, emergency services employment application. That was uh, a good one we did a year ago. It, uh, it, we got rid of all our old applications. We kept having different versions show up and uh, we modernized it. So now we're asking for email addresses and and uh, cell phone providers so we can send texts and things like that. Uh, so we're getting, it, it, it doesn't need any changes in long story short. E11, non-reliance on water wells and dead man's flats. There, all these uh, these things all filled in with silt. Uh, they weren't being used for many, many, many years. So obviously, it's it can be rescinded. Inspection for the Harbor Heights water store storage. It's an old policy from 1998. Um, a lot of people don't even know it even existed. So obviously, it can be tossed. Emergency response to false alarm and then. Uh, false fire and intrusion alarms. Um, so we we had a lot of problem problems with uh, with this. So we we um, changed our we've we've actually now got a false alarm bylaw that covers everything. So it's it's replaced this, um, and and uh, it gave us a way to kind of deter these. Uh, false alarms by by way of ticketing. Again, you'd have to you'd have to look at uh, how that uh, at that false alarm bylaw to get all the details. I'm just you know this is just a summary, right? Excuse me, if I might to the, through the chair, Rick. Um, yeah. A couple of the members had their hands up. Wayne's had his hand up for a little bit, and so has Jen oh. Smith. No, oh, I can't see the screen. I can't see that screen. I'm only looking up. That's all right. Wayne just dropped it. Sorry, I um, had a question earlier, but it got answered. Sorry. Okay. Any anybody else for questions? Jen, go ahead. Uh, it was just more of a clarification. I was fine to wait to the end, but um, you have at least five that I found on this list that um, are current and we don't need any changes on, and others that are outdated and if we could just see the policy and what it replaced could easily come off. Um, is there any way that as a group we could see all of these together with what's current so that we could make appropriate changes and rather than voting tonight to mm -hmm. remove? Um, well, I, I, would, I think there's I, lots of valuable stuff in here, Rick, but um, being a new counselor, I'm not familiar with everything, so I'm feeling very overwhelmed. Okay, so I'd I'd suggest that the this way this is presented as a as a memo to Robert, and I'd suggest that that uh, that you take it as information, and then maybe recommend that Rob that he take it to the next level, which would be 
possibly a review of those ones that you do want to have a look at the wording to revise. Just my suggestion. I don't know if Rob okay. has a comment on that or not. No. Thank you for that intention, Rick. Um, I'm happy to hear the, the rest of these bullet points. I didn't really need to interrupt partway through. Okay. Thank you. Anybody Go else? Ahead, yeah, it's just through the chair's fault, but what Rick said. Yeah, this was just an information memo that was sent to me by Rick. Rick prepared all this. This was to give you a taste of what's going on and to bring back the actual policies for you to review. I didn't think we needed to do that tonight, but certainly you've got a heads up now that there are a number of policies that need to be rescinded and some that will need to be amended. Okay. Okay. So as I started out with, if you've read it, they, that, that's, I've got some suggestions and that doesn't mean uh, we do this or don't. It's, it is again up to the committee. Uh, where do we, Invoice so think, doesn't need to be changed. Non-authorized volunteers, emergency situations, just clarifies. Uh, I guess you'd have to look in our fire services bylaw, uh, which talks about, uh, re, you know, getting the public to help us when we want, and and uh, yeah, and only when we want. So trying to control volunteers at emergency scenes can be kind of a. It can be pretty. Uh, Pretty, it could be a job all by itself trying to control all the the volunteers. So, um, policy E17 hazmat at all of the, at highway incidents. Uh, there's history behind this one. Um, I think it it could be revised somewhat. So, uh, if you guys agree later after we're done this, uh, we'll be discussing it at a later time. Uh, Limitations e, ES18, limitations to provisions of fire protection services. Um, it's just some terminology there. Fire protection members, why can't we call them firefighters, right? And uh, and just, just a very minor uh, uh, changes that I saw, but I think they're worth changing. Firefighter compensation, I don't hey, see any. Rick, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt. Uh, Wayne's got his hand up there. Sorry, it's Leslie. Sorry, Wayne, not to interrupt. Rick, can you please stop sharing your screen? Oh, I think you okay. have some things up there that might not, should be. What screen are you looking at? Your whole screen. So the box with the X is what you want to touch. Okay. I... Nope, you're still sharing your screen. How's so that? Down in the corner. No, which corner? You're still sharing your screen, so everything you have is down in your right hand corner. How's that? Is that better? Nope, you have to pick the box with the X. On Teams. You'll that? be down. Oh, I see, right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. There you go. No, I just had a simple comment. Um, ES16. I went through quite a few of these policies as well, and there's there's a one occurrence of the word fire guardian as well. So ES16 might just need to be briefly looked at or touched, if 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 the committee decides to remove the concept of fire guardian. Okay. Well, I I'm not. I'm not certain what you guys were looking at. I couldn't I can't see the screen I'm looking at right now. So I was at a loss when someone's putting their hands up and I hope I didn't embarrass myself by whatever else was on the screen. Any Just more your questions? desktop. Oh, any more? Hmm, I gotta think about that now. Any more <laughs> questions? Wayne, are you good now? I see your hand is still up. Apologies, I'll take it down. <laughs> Sorry, it yeah, yeah, it's just very minor to ES16. That's all. Okay. Thanks. Okay, Rick, uh, I think you can go ahead. I think everybody's good. Well, unfortunately, I I don't want to try that again. I, I can't see my memo anymore. So <laughs> you guys have read it, hopefully, and, and just, you know, I'd suggest you just recommend that Rob go the, take it to the next step. If anybody wants any background, I mean, I've been out here in Jameson 30 plus years. Um, 
I look forward to to calling my guys firefighters other than fire guardians. It, it's such a small thing, but it's so big. Um, when we first started, it was a 56 Dodge parked in Ian McGregor's barn uh, or his dad's barn. And I mean, it, there's a lot of work been done over the years to work with the Canadian government, the Alberta government and the MD Bighorn to put a fire hall out there, two bay fire hall, uh, equipped trucks. And uh, I'm very pleased with the fire members. And um, we are doing calls by ourselves, right? We're doing medical calls. Uh, very, very comfortable with our, our staff on that and team on that. Um, CO alarms, uh, bush fires, um, grass fires, and of course structure fires. But you know, we're well trained on when to call for help and call for help early. Um, so we know when to call in mutual aid and call in, you know, extra tenders and extra additional manpower as we need it. The guys are very comfortable with the radio system and whatnot. So I think it would go a long way. Um, you know, um, there's so many things that we do that may be slightly different than what Exxon does, and it would be nice to uh, to be able to kind of address the CEO directly and or via, you know, via, via Rick. But Rick has so much on his plate, too, that, you know, me as the, I guess I've been called the head fire guard for many years. Um, I, I sent I route everything through Rick and, you know, some of it probably shouldn't. Right. I mean, there's some important decisions that, you know, his his skills and knowledge are very helpful and he needs to be involved. But there's a lot of day to day stuff that uh, I think the group itself could handle. Um, yeah. So um, I, I very look forward to seeing if uh, the MD as a whole, um, you know, would have a series of firefighters versus fire guardians and and uh, be able to kind of understand our documents and clean up the documents to to kind of reflect um, the service that these guys do. Uh, and I think, Wayne, what we're going to do is I think Rick's going to make a motion mm -hmm. or or somebody will make a motion to the fact that we will remove the word guardian from all the literature and then we'll replace it with fire chiefs or firefighters, right? Yes. That sound, does that sound appropriate, Rick? Yeah, all, all the appropriate ranks, right? Yeah. We make yeah, up Robert, we make up the ranks. So, you know, the intent is good. The process is not. And I'll tell you how to do it. Um, what you want to do is you would like you need to send a have one of your uh, public members make a request that the CEO provide all of the ES policies to the committee. Um, my proviso would be: Do you want to see the ones, all of them, or just the ones that need to be amended or rescinded? I will make that motion asking that everything Rick has suggested that you bring forward the old policy and the new recommendation and then we look at them one at a time in future meetings and decide on the changes and that wording from fire guardian I certainly think should be eliminated but we will make that decision once you provide the appropriate information Rob in future meetings. I think it's more than reasonable for you to make that motion now as part of the revisions to the ES bylaws that the term fire guardian be removed and replaced with. And I just one I need to be clarified on this from from Rick or from Wayne. Do we call it district chiefs or do we just say fire chiefs? I see it as a district chief for Jameson and probably district chief for Ghost. Um, I'm not sure if there's an overall chief, if, if that's what we're referring to, mm -hmm. like a bighorn chief, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, I think um, I, I think it, sh it the organogram when I would describe it, I think it showed that a a fire chief could fill in for a district chief and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So you know, if that's stated, you know, I I I like the you know kind of like the org chart. I like to see that maybe if an org chart was made, you guys could see it would look better. Or look, see. Okay, so what Rick and I will do then is that we will prepare the amended changes to those bylaws that need to be amended, including those fire, term fire guardian. That will come back to a future meeting of the committee, and you will do go through and do the review. From there, we take that to council, and we have them deal with all the ES policies and making changes. We don't have to make all the changes at one time. But certainly, you want to be able to go through them and get them completely updated as per the memo brought up by Rick. Okay. So then, include in my motion the wording you need to do what I think we've agreed on here. Okay. Uh, is what I'm trying to okay, move things along because we can't make any final decision today in any of this. But 
we definitely need to look at it and make that decision down the road. That's my intent. So word it appropriately, please. Okay. And then Rob, you'll uh, in that we'll get a we'll get a copy of that motion with regards to the fire guardian. We'll be able to review that. Yeah, what will happen is that Linda's taking all of the minutes. Uh, well, I'll go yeah. through the minutes and make sure the motions are all appropriate. Um, and then we'll just move forward. But I'll, so Kevin, you're the mover for this last motion. And I have the other ones that were done here. Um, and you will get a copy of the minutes beforehand. Have a look. If you're comfortable with those, then those will be the final minutes. You know what was, what's been directed. I've got clear direction and to bring back uh, any, any action items that you've requested tonight. Okay, excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Rick, do you have anything else on on uh, seven eight? Uh, no, I don't. I don't okay. believe I do. Okay. Uh, then we move to seven B, which is the memorandum, the letter from Dead Man's Flats Community Association, the Fire Safety Committee regarding the fire event CWF one hundred eight near the hamlet of Dead Man's Flats. And who would like to speak to that? I can speak to that. Okay. Okay. As you can see, um, with the memo that I provided for you on page 59, um, after the fire at Dead Man's Flats, uh, there is a committee that's been struck. I believe it was struck before the fire event occurred, and that is their um, fire and safety subcommittee from the Dead Man's Flats Community Association. Um, so they had sent a letter to uh, to myself and to Rick. Uh, we did make a reply to them, which you can see attached to the document to the to the agenda. Um, in response to that, they wrote back another um, an email this time with asking for uh, more more questions. Basically, I thought that the our original letter uh, to them had answered all of the questions. However, um, they have so a few more. So I was just letting the uh, the committee have a look at this. I will be responding to them. In my last correspondence with Mr. Vandermeer, who is the, the head of the subcommittee, I had said that I would discuss it with this committee, also with Rick, and uh, that we would provide information back to him after this meeting today. So um, do you have any comments in regards to, obviously, the, um, Kevin, this is where you can bring up your comment about the uh, information officer. Um, also, if there's anything that you see and the letter from Mr. Vandermeer, uh, we can certainly incorporate that into our final response to that committee. Yes, I was well just hoping that we could clarify exactly how the communication lines are supposed to go, uh, because I think, well, in fact, everybody seemed to agree at the top of page 61, the first paragraph that, uh, yeah, after the after the after the debriefing sessions, it was determined that this communication method was not as effective as it should have been. Mm -hmm. Improvements are required. Yep. So, uh, and from uh, and from what I read elsewhere, it seemed as if the information officer with Alberta Wildfire was unavailable that evening, and then you contacted the industry liaison person the next morning and then the communication was restored and worked the way it should have for the next couple of days. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's any way we can try to prevent that from happening in the future because if you get if the MD gets the information as quickly as possible from Alberta wildfire, then you can make the decision to send the information out to using the MD system. And mm -hmm. if it needs to be used at the same time, it could be the Alberta alert because the MD may not be available to all the traffic sitting under Trans Canada, but the Alberta alert should be for most of them. It should be. I can let you know through the chair. Um, when that fire did occur, I was in contact with Chief Lister. He was there um, at the fire. I was getting information from him. I did make uh, overtures to the 
uh, information officer for uh, for the uh, for the province um, did not did fail to give me a call. However, I was still getting information coming back from uh, from the chief. Um, oh, I also okay. I was able to get information from that. Also going on to the website for Alberta Fire, there were updates going there from the information officer. So that oh, process wow. was working. It was oh, the connection sure. back to back to myself. Um, yeah. I I also personally know um, the industrial liaison, so I was able to make that connection and. The information office that that was clarified very quickly, but he became my primary source of information for the fire and that was passed on. What could have happened, which could have been which will be improved is the information coming through could have been put onto our rather than going through the DMF uh, community association is to actually put the information onto our website and get it onto our social media platforms, even though it likely just be the same as what's on Alberta wildfire. Um, it's close. There are residents. It's an easy way to get information to them. Yeah. OK, sounds like everything's underway to make it as good as we can. And mm -hmm. the little glitch that happened this time seems to be taken care of. So, And that was my only concern was that people, OK, locals especially, have some idea what's happening as quickly as possible. And yeah, I could see the smoke and it was far enough away. I wasn't concerned, but the people much closer obviously were concerned as they had to be. And there were hundreds of emails from people getting onto Facebook about who were driving by and we were getting all kinds of information was flying through. The only relevant information is really anything that comes from the RCMP or from Alberta wildfire or ourselves. So mm -hmm. that's the information people really need. They get, if you can get too caught up on the Facebook information. Yeah, there's no telling what what's right or wrong about that information. It needs to come from a reputable source. Yeah, OK. I think that answers everything I had. Thank you. Well, I can just say one word. It's even though I'm right there and I can see the situation and I got my opinion, it's not for me to say it's it's going to be OK or that it's it has to come from the guy in control of the fire and that's Alberta wildfire. So that's that's what makes it awkward when you're in that position. But uh, it's their fire and they're it's it, you know they they're the ones that release it have to release the information it's not for me to do so just awkward uh but isn't it the case that once they release that information into the md that the md has has the choice as to whether or not okay they make it public right away you know, and what details they provide yeah absolutely so, yeah, Absolutely. I'm just looking for efficiency from them to the MD and then the local people okay, have the options that they as to how quickly they send it out to the community. Mm -hmm. And it seemed to me from what I read that uh, uh, Alberta wildfire had kind of dropped the ball. But from what Robert said, it, it was much better than what I thought. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure with you being there in the scene, you could connect with Rob as you did. And uh, uh, yeah, because who makes the decision as to what goes out from the MD? Is that you, Rob, as the CAO in well, consultation with Rick? Yeah, we have also have our own information officer. Um, those those folks went around during the fire, yeah. um, which, is, which is fair ball. So suddenly it occurred. But no, I mean, I can get information. Um, that's given to me. I certainly cannot put it onto our website because it's contrary perhaps to what some of the information is being given by Alberta wildfire. And so that's why there's it has to be the inf messaging has to be controlled very carefully. Oh, OK. OK. Good. That clarifies a lot of things for me. Thanks. So just, Robert. Yeah. Sorry. No, go ahead, no, please. Just, sorry. Just for a point of clarification, uh, the last the communication that you had with Scott Vandermeer that we see is the November 4th email. Is that correct? Yes. OK. So there, uh, there isn't an email that I'm missing or we're missing. OK. No. Thank you. He, had sent, he actually sent an email about a week ago, and I had said we're meeting on this this week. So he's aware that the committee is meeting. He may be watching right now. Oh, OK. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
So as for uh, seven item 7B, seven do we have anything else to add to that, uh, Robert? Or are we good on, on 7B? I think you're fine, unless you have any information that you want to talk about on, on page 56, and that's the, uh, the email from uh, Mr. Vandermeer. Is there anything in there? We have, we have, we have responses for these. I'm just more curious, I guess, does the committee have any comments about any of these uh, questions raised by Mr. Vandermeer and his committee? I think the only question that I would have is with his, uh, I think he had a concern with regards to where their evacuation area would be. Mm -hmm. And I know just looking through uh, what Stu just presented, I think it's the open field by the recycling and station. Is that where the evacuation area is? I have to go back. Let me just check my I notes. believe it's, it's what's, 200. What's the, you know? Pardon me? Um, I'm sorry. I'm just going through to see what, what zone it is. Uh, zone 13. Okay. And I believe it says in there the open field at 200 Second Street. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So that's the open field by the, uh, the recycling and, and the garbage containers there, correct? Yeah, on yeah. the map, it's a big A. Yeah. Big orange okay. A. So are they now aware of <laughs> that their evacuation is only case of emergency? Well, if they're watching, they will be now. <laughs> <laughs> so just to clarify a little bit, my understanding was that uh, uh, Mr. Vandermeer's request was where would the reception center be? Um, uh, not the assembly point. I, th I think Mr. Vandermeer was, was asking uh, where they could meet up with their family members that were outside of the community at the time that the highway got shut down. Um, and so I think the answer to that question is that there is a reception center to the east or to the west, pardon me, at the Harvey Heights Community Center. There is a reception center at Exshaw. And there is a reception center to the east. Uh, the closest one, I believe, would be Jumping Pound uh, Community Hall, I think. Yeah. Um, okay. Or the ghost. But I mean, if you're going to go to the ghost, you probably just go to Aksha. So, so there are there are reception centers north, east, and west um, that that could have been chosen and used. If if there was an evacuation, um, correct. Call. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just by yep. sorry. And just, just by reading reading his email uh you know it just it states you know in 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 the sit in the situation that our community would have been evacuated where would residents go so i think that's a pretty uh broad statement you know is it a temporary evacuation where do they go and yeah you know so i just wondered if they do they have that information of where they can go they would be go ahead sure. Rick. I was going to say they they need to wait for the direction because we it might be closer to go to you know the one to the west but it's not practical right. we'd send them east so it's going to be at the call of the incident commander which is the most practical place to go and we could also call a mutual aid and say hey town of Camor can you open a reception center for us or town of Cochrane so those are other options as well okay yeah Okay, well, that's all I had. Anybody else? Kevin, go ahead. Uh, just directing to Rob. Uh, yeah, is there any particular questions in his document that you would like our input on before you reply to them? There are quite a few of them seem to be well, budgetary to some degree, and of course, without knowing what the MD budget is for such things, it's it's hard for us to say what the MD is able to do and not able to do. And one that 
we discussed a little bit on this committee a year or maybe two years ago was concerning sprinklers. We watched a little video one night on a sprinkler on the roof of a building that did an amazing job of protecting it in a fire. And yeah, I thought it seemed like a fantastic idea. And at the time, uh, the uh, uh, the MD could get a very good price if you audit a certain amount of them. And from my point of view, after the MD, if the MD was interested in ordering them in quantity, uh, uh, the price for a household was cheap enough that the rest of it, uh, I, mean, I felt the individual, if they wanted that kind of protection for their home, could easily afford it themselves if they showed an interest. Yeah, because from the group discount was significant. Um, in fact, for the sprinklers, for the he makes note that the sprinkler deployment trailer that's actually in the 22 capital budget that the council will be discussing later in January, but it is in the in the budget for that. Um, as far as the home sprinkler kits, uh, Rick, I don't believe that we've got anything budgeted for those. It'd be for the individuals to uh, to purchase themselves. Uh, no, we don't have that program. It doesn't mean we could take it up and, and I think it's. Yeah, I, I, there's probably a way to do it. it. We'd have to take it to council because it's not included in the present budget. Oh, OK. Yeah, because it was the home kit I was actually speaking about and uh, and I was suggesting just if the MD bought them in quantity, uh, having some idea how many people might want them. Uh, the MD would be reimbursed by the individual uh, members of the community uh, because the MD did their part by buying them in quantity and getting them at roughly half price, if I remember correctly. And if and if that isn't in this year's budget, I would suggest we take another look at it for another year. Well, I think. Go ahead, Rick. No, I I think. Uh... Well, I, I might be speaking out of turn, Rob. Maybe you should speak to it. But I think it, something like that initiative. I don't. I think it's something you probably take to council at any time. They could consider. They can always say no, right? Um, but I re, I recall that meeting, and and I don't know for some reason uh, we didn't discuss it. Like uh, you know, further as a program. It could be similar to our lockbox program where we buy the lock boxes and then resell them to the people that need them. So I it could be done that, uh, you know, similarly. But uh, anyhow, that, that I don't think it's for discuss discussion right now, but I think we could bring it forward later for sure. Robert? Yeah, I'm fine with something being discussed about it later. And the firebox idea that you just said where uh, Okay, people buy it themselves. That's what I'm suggesting. And I've got my answer for now. And if it, and I just want it looked at sometime down the road. Okay. Are there any other items that? Uh the committee wants to make it a point about as I will I'll take obviously in the comments I've just received and that will go into the final uh, response back to the subcommittee of the of the uh, community association and communication we've already we've already gone through that we've already had the discussion today so yeah it could have been improved from the original one back in when the fire occurred absolutely it could um, but again communication as our uh, as Rick pointed out, sometimes that comes from the incident commander and it could be the province or it could be us. It totally depends on the circumstances of the of the fire event. Okay. So do you have answers? Sorry, this is Wayne. So you have good answers for I mean the very he has a comment of communication, then he has a pair of called evacuation, which we, we've discussed. You have an answer for that. So you're just gonna answer each of these uh, each of these questions that appear in each section, right? Yes. Fire assessments, fire smart awareness. Do you have everything you need for that? I'm sprinklers. I know we talked about that. And then lastly is, is training. And, and he's asking us questions if we're, we're familiar with the interface course, fire at the interface, and uh, the answer is yeah. Um, so do you have, were you able to answer all these um, with without additional help? 
Yeah, I've already, I've already had a discussion with uh, with Stu about some of these questions and with Rick, so we've pretty got final answers for most of them. But I just wanted to know if you've got any if things sort of stood out for you in making any any more comments to it. No, I think it looks fine. Thank you. Yeah, um, looks good to me as well. Anybody else have anything? Oh, Kevin, you've got your hand up. Oh, I just didn't take it down. Sorry. OK, <laughs> but everything sounds good to me at this point. OK. So I, I guess we'll move now. Uh, Robert, are, do you have anything else to add with regards no. to that? No, 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 Mr. Chair, not at all. No, OK. Uh, so I think we'll move now. We'll move to uh, updates from the districts and directors. Uh, who would like to go first? Uh, Jameson, go if you like. Or do you want to go, Rick, with your disaster services first, and then Exxon, and then followed by Jameson, and I guess there won't be one from Ghost. You're on mute, Rick. Rick usually summarizes all my calls, but I can. <laughs> okay, wait <for> so, <laughs> yeah, so um, at the beginning, uh, Mr. Hebb said, let's keep it to five minutes. So I'm going to do my very best uh, for on on behalf of like the entire uh, department. This has been our busiest year so far. We've got 270 calls between us uh, so far, and we still got like three weeks in the year to go. Uh, our previous biggest year was last year, which was 218 calls. So we've uh, we, you know, surpassed that by I don't know how many percent, but we've been very busy this year. Uh, of the 270 calls, there was 30 in JR, uh, Jameson Road. That's their biggest year so far, and uh, 31 in Ghost. So Ghost has also been busy in uh, 209 in Exha so far. So quite a busy year. Uh, as far as Exha, um, currently we're we're experimenting with an app called I am responding and uh, that's an app that uh, a text gets generated from dispatch and it goes to a I am responding organization that gets thrown out to all the smartphones and alerts our members that uh, you know there's a call happening and they're able to uh, respond from their phone and we can it gives us a sense of how many people are are going to be uh, responding. Uh, it could be displayed on a screen in the hall and uh, as well uh, in uh, from day to day people can put in their availability so they can say you're on not available from you know today for two weeks and that sort of thing so then that gives us a sense from day to day how many people are going to be around so we're just testing it out and it works it works very well so far mapping is really good we're really pleased with that so um, just to say Ghost and Jameson have been using it for some years now and they're quite happy with it. So it's kind of kind of goes in with our, you know, we're, we're losing some features with our old radio system. So uh, it'll it'll uh, give us a, a backup paging system of sorts. Um, that said, I think um, I our, I talk about our AFRAX radio system. So there's been quite a few um, delays. We were about ready to implement it when our uh, we had a big channel map planned, and that was using all our mutual aid partners in the most sensible fashion we could we could think of, and uh, and then Calgary uh, Dispatch came up with a, a, a request about two months ago, um, so we delayed the implementation, and we're going to follow the regional plan. So there, Calgary. Um, fire dispatch are going to make uh, 13 talk groups available for use amongst the members. So that's a, that just solves all our mutual aid problems. We don't have a new agency coming in and say, here's my talk groups. You got to put them in your radio. And now you got to reprogram every radio in the fleet, which I, th I think would cost about 10 grand every time we asked it, we have to do that. So this is great news for us. And then there's going to be three dispatch channels or talk groups. So it's going to be really good. I'm glad that we delayed. Um, it, it's going to be really good, much, very much easier to use for the firefighters. So it's good news all around. 
Uh, they say they expect probably in January. So I, I don't know if it'll happen in January, but that's what they say. So hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's all I want to say about uh, about the fire department. And as far as uh, direct emergency management, um, we talked about the sprinkler trailer that's been proposed. Uh, that's in the budget. Um, also, another thing as far as communications, we put in the budget where we'd like to be able to replace the sign or uh, buy a new signboard and increase our inventory of signboards so we can have maybe we have one for every hamlet build up to that or at least have more than one. We've only got one in the whole MD, so I think there's a need for more. So we're going to try and get one a year and, and build up an inventory site so we can do a little bit better job of communicating. Uh, the uh, ESS plan is very, very important to us and, and uh, hopefully council supports that. It's a, it's where we're, I feel we're quite weak. You know, we, uh, we sure got shown in 2013 how important it is, you know, how, how important it is to look after people and, and we just don't have a lot of staff and it's just a weak area and, and uh, this plan is, uh, it's kind of run by the, there's a provincial ESS plan. So our plan will fit in with the other ESS plans in the province because we know we're going to need help when, if we have another big one. And so the people provincially will be able to help us. They're going to be familiar with the plan because they work under similar plan. So anyhow, it's a big, very, very important thing we need to do. And then I talked earlier about uh, NG911. So that's next generation 911. So what that that uh, means, uh, it's mandated by the federal government. They got a certain date in place where every PSAP, so that's public service answering um, something, or I forget exactly what it is, but it, basically it's a 911 call centers. They all have to meet a certain standard. And that mean basically that means they're all accessible through the internet, no more copper lines. And uh, with that, there's they've got so much more ability to do things using the internet. Uh, people will be able to text and send videos and all that to the dispatch center, so they can be distributed. You know, they could I don't know, for example, you could someone could show a video of a fire that's happening, and that could be sent to the whatever agencies need to see it, right? All kinds of information. So, our part is uh, we we have to provide a lot of information uh, for the the uh, NG nine one one network, and that's where Elrika comes in. She's, you know, we we have to find out exactly what they're looking for. But uh, the example I gave, where we have a lot of roads in the MD that aren't on the map, they will have to be on the map we give to NG nine one one. They don't have to be on the maps released to the public, but they definitely have to be uh, provided to uh, you know the, this this network. We you know we can't we can't have send police, ambulance, other emergency workers to an area where there are roads, but we don't identify them for our whatever reasons. So I I think that's five minutes. So I'll just leave her at that. Take any questions if you want after. Okay, um, so I can jump in for Jameson here. Um, our new truck was delivered um, quite recently within the last month. Uh, together with that, when they delivered the truck, they also brought a fellow down and, and did some uh, training that was uh, attended by all fire members. So we had a good three or four hours uh, working with the truck from the, from the experts. Um, it's a Rosenbauer a Ford 550. Uh, we call it mini pumper, but it's kind of registered as a 168 engine. Um, it has been busy. It's been out on three or four calls from structure fires, and it provided it, it performed very well on the structure fire out uh, on Nakota. Um, it's gone to medical calls and some CO alarms as well, and a bush fire investigation. Um, the truck, um, I mean, we're checking everything on it. We had one little bump on the road where uh, we have a, an inverter on the truck that provides, you know, AC power from the truck. And uh, we were testing everything. We found out that they'd undersized all the cabling from the inverter back to the battery. Um, so for the last uh, week, and it's been returned to us just recently, it went back up to uh, to um, Rocky Mountain Phoenix and Red Deer, uh, where it, they put in the proper size cabling, proper fusing. 
and uh, was able to confirm that we have an 1800 watt inverter working properly. So we're, we're giving it a run through. We're making sure it is everything we asked for in RFP and it's looking really good. The members are really excited to have this five passenger truck uh, to complement our, our two seat uh, bush buggy as well. Um, the 82 Superior, the old engine, uh, was removed and I believe it's gone to auction. It went to auction. I, I don't have any updates on, on that, but it definitely went to the auction. So it's, uh, it's off the uh, premise. Um, some of the other things that the fire members have been doing, um, I think Rick mentioned, uh, we're, we, all our members have the AFRAX radios, which are the P25 radios. They really are working well. Um, we and Jameson are kind of midpoint between Exhaw Tower and, of course, Ghost has a tower. That communications has, has been a challenge, uh, radio communications. Uh, we, you know, the members are very excited because we can get to anywhere in our, our service area. And uh, the AFRAX radios, uh, the way they're programmed today, um, are working really well. We have, uh, we have um, a really solid connection to dispatch. And that's good to know if we ever need mutual aid or, or help from the other agencies. That we, you know, communication is so important. Um, um, Brad's been kind of instrumental in, in working with uh, folks down at uh, Ghost Lake Village. Um, for the committee, I think we understand that Ghost Lake Village has a service agreement with the MD of Bighorn. Uh, Jameson's kind of primary, and Exhaw is, is certainly available for backup. Uh, good relationship with the folks down there. Um, they had they had Brad and I down there probably, um, let's say, a month ago just to talk about some of the budgets and some of the items they'd like to do, and one of the big ones was water storage, right? So we're not going to do any engineering for them, um, but we just said, hey, as a fire service, this is what would work for us. Um, so there was really good discussions uh, on where they could uh, bury a tank and how we could fill the tank over multiple years. You know, fill it by trucks the first year and over over their budget intervals, um, there's ways of getting an intake out of the lake that could actually fill it with a proper, um, you know, authorization for the different groups. But we made no commitments. We were just there kind of, uh, as, you know, to offer some information. Um, but that was really well received. Um, also, Ghost Lake Village has asked us to participate in the tabletop exercise in the spring with the other emergency services and, and, um, and uh, we've agreed to, uh, you know, uh, to participate in as well. So really good, really happy with our relationships with those folks. Uh, we do do medical calls down there. We have done a number of fire calls as well. Um, but um, it's kind of equivalent to ghost having wipers just around the corner. We have, we have ghosts down the hill. So uh, very pleased with um, how that's been working out. A couple of capital projects. Um, we had some bunker racks, uh, additional bunker racks that uh, the members, uh, we got together yesterday, one of our fire practices, and we mounted that in the fire hall. So it's a very tight little fire hall. Um, so we're doing our best to efficiently uh, mount uh, mount the equipment and, and, of course, mount bunker bunker lockers and stuff like that. And uh, it worked out well. Um, the water pump, I mean, over the years, we have a buried tank. Uh, the buried tank is fed by a well. And then uh, one of the last capitals was to actually purchase equipment to, to put it under pressure. Um, I can report that we did all the underground, um, all, all the underground services, you know, be at the be at the pipe, be at the electrical and all the control signals. And uh, we just need a little bit of time. We have the pump. We have all the fittings. We just need to um, basically evacuate that tank uh, properly and safely and um, get a person down there to actually hang the pump inside. And then we'll have pressurized water that's keypad controlled that our fire department can fill up quickly uh, or, or, or extra tender, for instance, if they're, they're on scene and we've used them before, they can have a quicker way of, of getting water up on the hill without having to cycle out to, to Morley. So I'm very pleased with how that went. All the members had all sorts of skills from, you know, running little mini hose to, uh, to, to do all the fittings and, and locate service. So we did everything, um, you know, per proper. We had it properly located for services and whatnot, and it was safely done. So pleased with the memberships doing that. Um, yeah, I think I mentioned earlier some of the calls we've been going on and medical calls, um, uh, medical calls more so uh, on the Dakota Reserve at our end of the MD, um, you know, just near Ghost Lake, uh, CO alarms there as well, and, um, and um, that one structure fire out on the reserve a few weeks back, but um, I think that's it. Uh, is there any questions for Jameson? Or have I been mute the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> no, you definitely haven't. <laughs> Thanks, thank Wayne. you. Uh, Kevin, thank you. go ahead. I just wanted to say, Rick, your increase was 
in the number of calls. And you mentioned the NG991 is a federal program upgrading the 911 system. And I noticed the other day that my Shaw bill says I'm going to get an extra charge starting in January. So I assume that's associated with the new system. But uh, it's good news that it's being updated because it's been the odd problem in the past. I've written ones on the internet where somebody phoned with a cell phone and the emergency services went to a different county since nobody knew where the cell phone was located. So that type of improvement hopefully eliminates that kind of a problem. And Dino, you did just great today. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you for assuming chair. Yeah, and Unless we got more business, uh, uh, Rick, do you have anything? Do you have anything else to add, or nobody's got any other questions for Rick? I do. That's why my hands up. Oh, hi. Hi, it's me. Um, being the newbie here, uh, can and knowing that it's coming forward to council on the budget, Rick, can I have more information? You can even email it to me on the sprinkler trailer. Um, it sounds exciting. I know absolutely nothing about it. I'd love to learn. Um, and for the um, upgrades to the 911 um, and the no more copper lines, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Is there a backup for when a catastrophe happens and a whole city goes off the power grid? What do you do there? Cyber attacks, shutting down 911. We can learn from the states. Is there backups? What do we do? I sure hope so. <laughs> but, uh, no, I think it's, uh, yeah, uh, it's like I say, it's mandated. So we're, it's it's a go. Uh, I'm sure they got lots of, I. that's a technical question I, I just can't answer. You know, I, I think there's a lot to look forward to. Um, just the kind of information that they can draw from in emergency is going to be on, you know, you know, like the say the world's the oyster here, you know. So uh, I think it'll be better for everybody um, all around. And I and agree. It sounds fabulous, and I love the the ability to send live pictures to 911 so they can get the appropriate people out there. I think it sounds fantastic. All of the research I've done, but. No one's been able to answer what happens when there's a catastrophe and the entire city of Calgary goes off the grid. How are we going to deal with that? So yeah. that was just not necessarily directed to you. Yeah, we'll have More to ask. towards the federal government. Hope they're watching. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to ask someone else for that. Um, about the sprinkler trailer, um, it's uh, it's. It's around. Uh, it's under two hundred thousand. It's somewhere between one hundred and seventy-five. But it, it's equipped. If I, if I remember, recall, it's probably about fifty homes could be protected, and they would. You know, I mean, being on a trailer, we could move it to wherever it's needed in the MD. Um, we've been building a smaller sprinkler trailer with uh, kind of kits, like ten sprinkler kits. The idea is ten sprinklers would be more than enough to. Uh, protect a set you know a couple of houses you know say in a in acreages or something like that so we you know we have we have that currently and we're kind of working on it as time goes on but the big sprinkler uh trailer would be would be available to kind of you know maybe would just pro provide a perimeter around a you know a hamlet or a subdivision or a group of homes something like that or do every every home in that subdivision depends and that's another thing i guess i could say uh, Stu and i our next project is to work on a wildfire pre-plan and uh, we would be preparing sprinkler plans for subdivisions and hamlets and and so forth and and uh yes and you know you'll get more on that later thanks rick Anybody have anything else to add? Okay. So I think that comes to the end of our our uh, our meeting. And I guess the next thing on the uh, on the agenda would be to set a date for our next meeting, a time and a and a date for our next meeting. Is that correct, Robert? Oh, you're on mute.
Yeah, you're correct. We could also just uh, we can set a date or it can just be at the call of the chair. When we've got the information ready. We'll, we bring it back through you to call the meeting. OK, it's really a, it's really the preference of, of the committee. OK, what does the committee prefer? I prefer setting a date because um, then it's not all on my shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, come on. They're nice big well, shoulders. <laughs> I don't. Um, do we need to set a date um, fairly quickly due to all of the information that we'll have to review, or are we just doing that via email? I don't think it'll take very long for Stu or me to uh, amend that uh, plan with the changes you guys want. It won't take long at all, but you know, Christmas is in between and uh and, and having those policies uh that we talked about having them brought forward that that won't be but it is going to be it is going to take time in a meeting uh but i i don't see it you know because i think we're ready to to approve that evacuation plan at least i i don't see a reason why we couldn't have one in january yeah okay uh, and i'm all for that the sooner we can get that done and off our off our plates it'd be great so when in January, uh, when in January would you guys like to meet? I'm open. I could pretty well be any day. It'll just be same time, like four o'clock, right? Well, that's the other thing that I wanted to address as well mm. with regards to time. Mm. And, and I guess a question for Robert, uh, how long do we anticipate doing these teams meetings before we go back to in person? Do you figure? Mm -hmm. Good question. There's Thank an item you. by council next week for <laughs> to set to set the ball in motion to get people back for in-person meetings. Yeah, okay. All right. So I guess for now what we'll do is we'll just set a date in January and just we'll just uh I hate assuming, but I guess we'll just assume that we're going to be doing this through Teams again. Yes. Uh, is there any possible way that we can do this closer to five o'clock? It's anybody sure. I'm, I'm okay I'm, with it. Yeah. Okay. So I set the time. Somebody else set the date. Uh, please stay away from Wednesdays or stay away from the third Wednesday of the month since that's Municipal Planning Commission. Thursdays are a great day. Thursdays are a great day. So you want to do it for the 20th? I've got a intermunicipal meeting with Reva and I, and actually uh, Joss are meeting with the town of Canmore. That's one thirty till three, so five o'clock is easily accommodated. Rob, that's on the Friday the fourteenth. Oh, sorry. What was I thinking about the twentieth? Fine, no problem. Twentieth, it is. <laughs> are we looking at Thursdays? Yes, that's correct. So far. Just as an Everybody FYI, is, sorry, just as an ahead, FYI, just, I have uh, emergency alert training all day that day, so oh, I don't no, nope. don't know what time I will be done. Okay, that, and that's a full day, Les. Um, yep. Does it have to be a Thursday? Could we do change it around a little bit? Just to accommodate Leslie, just, is that a yeah. long day? We would be back to the 13th. The I'm okay 13th. for the 13th. Yeah. Sure, 13th at 5 is fine. Okay. Leslie's not Rick, yelling at me that I have a conflict, face. so. Not that I'm aware of yet. I don't have anything in my calendar either, so <laughs> I was hoping you'd yell at me if I was wrong. Uh, Thursday the 13th should work fine for me. Okay. Rick? And Rick? we'll start. And we'll well, start. Yeah. I, I did speak on behalf of Stu, so I don't know if he's still there to weigh in or not, but yeah, he's there. Um, 
Yep, the uh, 13th is fine for me. And uh, the quicker that everybody gets their their revision points to Rick, my preference would be to have it done prior to Christmas break. So, yep. Okay. All right, well, 13 should be good then. Okay. Those, those two items, I think, are fairly easy to put in the package. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So January 13th at 5 p.m. That's right. We're all good with that? Okay. Yep, Wayne is. Okay. Well, I think that concludes our meeting. Thanks, everybody, and thanks for your patience with me. Hopefully it gets better, and if it doesn't, feel free to fire me. Um, <laughs> Dino, uh, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. you did a great job. You just can get better.